send shivers down my spine to think about what happened. Oh my God. Everybody just started yelling to take cover. Oh my God! It's just so loud. We see the structure of the storm. Boy, that's big. That is like a spaceship, like a mothership. Oh, man, I wouldn't go much further. No tornado outbreak has affected so many people. It was as if someone had taken a giant blade and just scraped the earth. Everything was leveled. Oh, man. Oh, come on. I thought, that's it. This is my time. This is how I'm going to go. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. The devastating power of tornadoes is felt across the globe on nearly every continent. 75% of the world's tornadoes happen in the United States with hundreds of violent twisters wreaking death and destruction every year. Looks like I just missed the bus. And it appears to be getting worse. An uptick in the number of large-scale tornadoes is emerging. Oh, it's still blowing. Is this mutating weather the result of climate change? People say tornado is both mesmerizing and beautiful, but it's also extremely destructive. Tornadoes have the strongest winds on planet Earth. And a strong tornado can have wind speeds that are over 300 miles an hour. Tornadoes form in the strongest thunderstorms when the conditions in the atmosphere are just perfect. However, not all thunderstorms produce tornadoes. Oh, come on. Why does one storm produce a tornado while another doesn't? It's one of the great mysteries of science. But weather experts do know the recipe for tornado formation. Warm, moist air rising and colliding with cool, dry air, which creates the needed instability to produce thunderstorms that can spawn spinning vortexes of air. Climate change is primarily the result of burning fossil fuels, releasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that get trapped in the Earth's atmosphere and in turn warm the planet's surface, including our oceans. The warming of the waters is absolutely massive. Uh, the, the oceans have absorbed over 90% of all the heat that we've added to the atmosphere, and half of that since just 1997. Warmer ocean temperatures can provide more humidity as fuel for these storms that produce tornadoes. More energy in the atmosphere can mean more storms. It can mean stronger storms. If the increase in moisture-laden air could foreshadow more extreme thunderstorm events, does that mean bigger and more devastating tornadoes? We aren't at the scientific knowledge base yet to say we're going to have more tornadoes. Collecting tornado data in the United States only started in the 1950s. That's not enough data to make conclusions about long-term trends in tornadic activity and the connection to climate change. There are studies ongoing that try to find those linkages, but the best that we know right now is that the environments that may produce thunderstorms are likely to become more variable and conducive for those type of events. But weather experts are seeing mutations in tornadoes, from an increase in the number of twisters that make up a cluster to violent vortexes touching down in unexpected areas. These new variations are proving to be disastrous. In the heartland of the United States sits Tornado Alley, where twisters are ubiquitous. This sweep of flat land stretches through to the Central Plains from Texas to South Dakota. But now, scientists are seeing a new trend southeast of Tornado Alley. 
This area is more densely populated than Tornado Alley and spans the deep south from Louisiana to Georgia to parts of Kentucky. This is Dixie Alley. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. March 3rd, 2019. Beauregard, Alabama. A small town situated in the middle of Dixie Alley. Severe storms are brewing nearby. It's Sunday morning, and Cora Jones is helping her mother get ready for church. I get up every Sunday morning about 8 30 and come over here and get her dressed for Sunday school and church, and we listen to some little gospel music. She's not overly concerned about the weather. Severe weather warnings have come before without event, and today, Cora doesn't expect anything different. But that particular Sunday, I told her I was going to cook her dinner. And I said, by the time you get out of church at 1, your dinner will be ready. Cora plans to cook the meal at her house just a few miles away and then bring it to her parents' home. This is where everybody meet it on the weekend. Grandkids, cousins, all of them meet out here up on the tree, laugh and talk. Mama sit down on the porch and dad will be up on the tree. A few miles away, Lee County Sheriff Jay Jones is closely monitoring the weather reports. We had, had actually been notified of, of the week previous that uh, we were in line for possible severe weather. By Sunday, Sheriff Jones suspects this isn't a typical storm. As the days wore on, Friday, Saturday, and then of course Sunday the day, the reports and the conditions being favorable for severe storms escalated as time went by. El Reno, Oklahoma. Nestled in the middle of the state, this town is very familiar with twisters. It's in the heart of Tornado Alley. And it's where storm chaser Jacqueline Whittle goes to work. I primarily chase storms in an area called Tornado Alley. And, uh, geez, how many tornadoes have I seen? I've lost count. I've seen so many in about nine years. There can be between 800 to 1,200 tornadoes per year in that part of the world. That area really gets its tornadoes in May and June. That's actually the peak of tornado season. Tornado Alley is in a unique geographical position. It's the nexus of where three distinct air masses converge. That's a warm, humid air mass from the Gulf of Mexico, a desert dry air mass from the desert southwest, and we have cold Canadian air. And those all are smashing into each other and creating fronts. And along those fronts, we can get thunderstorms, which then sometimes can produce tornadoes. Jacqueline and other storm chasers have been on high alert after following a deadly tornado that struck days earlier, just 40 miles from El Reno. I was so drained. I had seen some awful stuff and I just wanted to go home. I was ready, I was done. I was done with my storm chase. But as she monitors weather data, Information suggests that the tornado activity isn't over yet. All the parameters were in place for a tornado day. The vast majority of days when tornadoes occur start off as beautiful, sunny, hot, warm, humid, gorgeous days. The sun heats the ground. The ground then in turn heats the air. As we know, hot air wants to rise up. So now you've got this instability in the atmosphere. And as the day progresses, that instability gets more and more buoyant. It wants to go up. But we often end up with a layer of warmer air called the cap or a lid that keeps that unstable air from rocketing up into the upper atmosphere. Think of it like the lid on a pot holding that energy down. If that unstable air can punch through that cap, now you have this explosive development and a supercell storm can form. A supercell storm has a strong rotating updraft caused by wind shear. And wind shear is basically uh, winds coming from different directions as we go up in height in the atmosphere. And as long as you have that turning of the winds, you can take the updraft and you can start to tilt it and rotate it. A supercell 
It is the granddaddy of all clouds. It's the mother of all thunderstorms. Supercell storms can be up to twice the height of Mount Everest. And when the rotation of these supercell storms continues to tighten, that's when tornadoes form. Sheriff Jones is monitoring severe storm reports. Tornado activity appears to have increased here in the last decade, and today's forecast is not looking good. Of course, in the southeast with the, with the high heat indexes, and uh, we have considerable humidity, a lot of moisture in the air. Uh, conditions at times can be very favorable for tornadoes to occur. Dixie Alley can get the strongest tornadoes. They tend to get quite a few tornadoes every year. They usually happen early in the season, February, March, early April. The problem there is that there's a lot more people, a lot more roads, a lot more towns. So they tend to be more destructive than these violent tornadoes that hit the open farmland of the Oklahoma Panhandle. Sheriff Jay Jones is hearing reports of small scale tornadic activity in the central part of the state. In the past, Lee County has been lucky. These were generally lower end on the scale. Structural damage in most cases, roofs, uh, uprooted trees, down power lines, that type thing. But this Sunday morning, conditions are about to change. It was around 11 o'clock central time that we got word that the conditions had really elevated to the point that we really needed to pay strict attention to, to the weather circumstances. The National Weather Service alerts the public of a chance of strong tornadoes in south and east central Alabama and Georgia. Well, it was hot. Oh, it was hot. It was hot. Then everybody started getting out of church till when the rain started. It'll rain, it'll stop. Rain, it'll stop. By late morning, as Cora Jones is cooking at home, the National Weather Service issues a tornado watch that includes Lee County. There's a high chance of tornadoes. Even a couple of intense tornadoes are possible, with a probability of a strong tornado occurring within the next 30 to 60 minutes. One of her brothers, Emmanuel, arrives to help her bring dinner to their parents' place. And I was going to follow him home. But it started raining real hard. I said, I'd be on late on because I hate driving in the rain. As Cora waits out the weather, her brother navigates back to their parents' home through the increasingly violent storm. At 1.58 p.m., the tornado watch is upgraded to a tornado warning and an emergency declared, giving people in the tornado's path just a few minutes before touchdown. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Look at that one. Did you see it come down? <gasps> Worried, Cora calls her parents home and reaches her other brother, Benjamin. Benjamin answered the phone. And he said, uh oh, I hear something. And I was like, what did he hear? And everything just went dead. Lights at our house went out, everything, it was just quiet. There's a house right there. El Reno, Oklahoma. Storm chaser Jacqueline Whittle has been chasing storms up and down Tornado Alley for almost a week. She has one more day of assignment before she can head back home. The last chase day was a high risk day. All the parameters were in place for a tornado day. Today's one of those days where I can say, oh yeah, I yeah, know it's not gonna have a tornado again. And then it does because it's just, the atmosphere is kind of its mind of its own right now. Dry air from the west is moving towards El Reno, and forecasts promise a day with high humidity. We all kind of had this pit in our stomach. It was like, oh, these days are kind of scary. You know, how is this going to end? What are we going to see at the end of today? Tornadoes have caused destruction throughout every continent in the world, sparing only Antarctica. 2018, Europe. 628 tornadoes sweep across the continent, the vast majority along the Mediterranean coast. In March 2019, a treacherous twister tears through the southern districts of Nepal, 
killing at least 28 people and injuring more than 1,100. It's the first recorded tornado to hit the country in its history. In 2016, a mega tornado levels whole villages in China's Jiangsu province. At least 99 people are killed and nearly 850 injured, making this tornado one of the worst to hit China in half a century. It's interesting when we think about the hurricane scale, when we think about a category four or five hurricane, we know what to expect. Because tornadoes are so destructive, it's pretty much impossible to measure their wind speed directly. The enhanced Fujita scale is used to measure the wind speed and damage of tornadoes from zero to five. But a twister's category is only determined after it strikes and the damage can be surveyed. An EF0 tornado will be breezy. It might lift some of the shingles off of your house. An EF1 tornado, you might lose part of the roof of your house. Cars will be blown around. An EF2 tornado will rip the roof off of your house. It will push your car off the road, perhaps roll it. EF3 and EF4, these are very damaging. They will destroy your house, rip off the roof, knock down the walls and the strongest, the EF5, the entire neighborhood will be flattened and littered with debris from houses maybe blocks away. Canada ranks a distant second to the United States in numbers, averaging about 60 confirmed tornadoes a year, about 5% of what the US sees, although hundreds go undetected. Canada, they'll get a couple to 300 tornadoes per year, maybe on a busy year. The vast majority of those tornadoes will happen in the prairie provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. These provinces are often considered an extension of Tornado Alley. Canada has a second tornado hotspot in the province of Ontario. There is a mini Tornado Alley in southern Ontario. It's a really interesting sort of microclimate in Canada. There are all of the Great Lakes that surround this part of Canada, and the wind from those Great Lakes can converge together and create storms that can produce tornadoes. September 21st, 2018, Dunrobin, Ontario. On the edges of this mini tornado alley lies a picturesque town near the nation's capital of Ottawa. As a long, hot summer stretches into fall, temperatures are expected to reach as high as 82 degrees Fahrenheit, but humidity will make it feel more like the upper 90s. It was the weekend of the Carp Fair, which is a very large rural fair in this region. And so most of the kids within the region were attending the fair that day. Uh, they all get off school for the day. Early that day, meteorologists like Arnold Ashton at Environment Canada are predicting thunderstorms in the area, but nothing out of the ordinary. The thunderstorms that did form in the early afternoon didn't look that uh, scary on radar. The Carp Fair is the busiest day in the town, pretty much for us for the whole year. Sisters Julie and Cindy Delahunt have been running Dunrobin Meat and Grocery for 30 years. We've been here since 1977. Julie and I, our parents started running the store and then we, we just took over the family business. The store is known for one-stop shopping and is a hub of the community. Just a little local country store where everybody, like I say, knew each other and stopped and you'd always almost pretty much run into your neighbor, somebody you knew when you were at the store. That day, we were all very busy in the store serving customers and there was probably at least 30 people or more in the store at the time. As the day goes on, meteorologist Arnold Ashton is noticing an alarming change on the weather radar. Scattered thunderstorms were being propelled eastward with the strong low-level winds that day. And as the mid-afternoon approached, the heat and the humidity helped to sustain these storms and essentially help them grow into stronger, more intense, tornadic producing storms. Tornadic activity in the region typically peaks in July and August. Twisters in late September are very rare. Recognizing the anomaly, Arnold jumps into action. I spearheaded the drive to issue the first tornado warning 
The supervisor of the day issued the warning just a couple minutes later. It was basically screaming, get that warning out. A tornado warning is issued for a wide swath of eastern Ontario and Quebec. Around 3.30, the power went out for a few moments, but it came back on after maybe 15, 20 minutes, and it didn't start to get dark until 4 o'clock, maybe shortly after the clouds started to roll in. Volunteer firefighter Chris Burke leaves the fair, hoping to outrun the storm. I noticed the skies to my left were getting darker and darker and quite ominous. Type of sky that I had never seen in this region before. Fellow volunteer firefighter Corey Delorier heads to the store owned by sisters Julie and Cindy Delahunt. As I was heading into the store, the rain was torrential. It was heavy. Uh, some of it felt actually like hail. It actually hurt to get hit by it. It sends shivers down my spine to think about what happened during the critical hours in the late afternoon on September 21st. We were seeing this tornadic storm, the supercell, that essentially was dropping a tornado. El Reno, Oklahoma. It's early afternoon, and all data indicates a tornado in striking distance. Storm chaser Jacqueline Whittle is standing by. Bright blue sky, calm, hot, humid, and we went to a gas station, and we sat there, and we waited. But as the day wears on, Jacqueline and her storm chaser colleagues are losing confidence that a tornado will touch down. Just when we're thinking today is probably going to be a bust, we start to see the first blip on radar. And what that means is there's probably a cloud that's producing a little bit of rain. That's our first storm cell of the day. Within minutes, the cloud has grown, and a tornado warning is issued. It touches down within miles of Jacqueline. I can remember driving. The next thing you know, we see the structure of this storm that is like a spaceship, like a mothership. It's just beautiful, but it's so large that we can't really make out what it is in an environment with a lot of moisture. So when that happens, sometimes you can get a tornado but you can't see it because it's wrapped in rain. There's rain coming out of the thunderstorm, so it impedes the view of the tornado. Beauregard, Alabama. There's a tornado! tornado! A tornado touches ground and roars through parts of Alabama. A couple of our deputies lived just north of the track of the storm. They actually observed the front coming through. They said that one minute everything was, was quiet, and the next minute the, it was just like a, a switch had been flipped. Oh my God, it is. Right in the road. The winds intensified, and they could see items from the ground uh, being lifted up, and they knew that, that it was a tornado. The monster tornado churns across the landscape for about 70 miles. Mother, because the transformer just blew. Crossing the state line and ending in Georgia. I got in my vehicle and immediately began monitoring the radio traffic from our units. Sheriff Jay Jones is still not sure what to expect. When I got to the area where the storm had, had come through, it was as if a, a curtain had been lifted and everything was leveled as if someone had, had taken a giant blade and just scraped the earth. Trees uprooted, power lines down, empty slabs where homes had, had once stood, now just, just bare ground. I knew it was going to be bad. The tornado hits areas where families have lived for generations. This was on a Sunday afternoon, and this was, was after church, and, and a lot of folks will go to their relatives' homes and have a, a, a Sunday afternoon dinner wasn't a work day uh, school was not in session so a lot of people were home that might not otherwise have been there had it been a two o'clock say on a, on a Tuesday or a Thursday or something like that the twister causes devastation throughout the county devastation that blocks Cora Jones from reaching her family's home to find out if they're okay me and my son got in the truck we started seeing all the trees and they 
guys just jumping out of the truck with chainsaws. Ain't nobody changing no words or nothing. They just cutting up trees, getting them out the road, getting them out the road. Amid the chaos, her cousin Anita is also scrambling to get to the area. We helped move the trees out the road to get over here. I ain't making no further than down the road where I met Corrette. So I said, let's go. We're gonna start walking. And this one, we just moved trees, dropped those limbs and power lines, doing what we had to do to get out here. El Reno, Oklahoma. A tornado warning has been issued and storm chaser Jacqueline Whittle is on the front lines. Highways and roads are jammed with desperate people trying to outrun it. We were looking across the field about a half a mile to our west. I saw this big wall of rain. A friend of ours said, there's a tornado in there, and he had visual, but we didn't have visual. And then I noticed this wall of rain accelerating toward me and toward our car. And I said to my chase partner, we got to go. That's, that's coming our way, and it's, it's moving fast. Let me, I'm going to do hurricane protocol. I'm going to come around. Gonna... A mutant tornado touches down just a half a mile from their car. It's clocking wind speeds of 295 miles per hour. And at 2.6 miles across, it's wider than Manhattan. And when we saw the tornado coming, everybody hit the gas, and we wanted to get out of its way and drop south. But the problem is, is, as we're dropping south, the tornado is accelerating and passing us behind us on the road. It was one of those moments that I thought, that's it. This is it. This is my time. This is how I'm going to go. Beauregard, Alabama. Sheriff Jones surveys the extensive damage inflicted by the tornado. I heard on our radio traffic that we had a victim. I went to that location, and I remember thinking to myself, this is not going to be the only person that lost their lives in this storm. We had a lot of manufactured homes in the area, and generally, it's just not a condition where folks have a uh, below ground or below grade of level of the home to take refuge. I was in this room right here with the whole top that came up all the house. The uh, common theme is get in the bathroom, get in the bathtub, and things, which, which is better than nothing, of course, but... I, I said, Joe, I said, you hear that? Boom! Then thing with a trim to shake. With a mobile home, uh, manufactured housing, it, it's just obviously not as strong as a as site built. Cousins Cora and Anita struggled to get through dangerous debris for half a mile before reaching the two-lane road where their family lives in mobile homes. We didn't see nothing. Trees, houses, everything. Just stuff everywhere. You know, you see tornadoes on the TV out in Texas or something like you be saying, my God, I pray for those folks. But right here in our own backyard, we didn't see nothing but broken trees, not a house in sight. Gone. In Dunrobin, Ontario, Julie Delahunt is serving customers in her store. I thought it was just going to be like a, a high wind, like thunderstorm, and probably going to lose the power, because we do lose the power quite often out here, but never, ever dreamt of it to be a tornado. Customers and staff watch weather conditions increasing in severity. One moment, everything was normal, the next, Everything got really, really black, and people were starting to check their phones because the alerts were coming through. And as a normal, most people ignore them, but you, you, you couldn't. The shopping carts started to fly by, trees started to bend, and then everybody just started yelling to take cover. And A tornado packing winds up to 165 miles per hour strikes the quiet Canadian town. But meteorologists at Environment Canada aren't sure about what's happening on the ground. We had no reports from social media in general. 
We were waiting with bated breath for every radar signature to, uh, to give us an update on where the storms were. And uh, it was just a, a crazy couple of three hours. Volunteer firefighter Corey Delorier takes cover in the sister-owned grocery store. Two of the store employees and myself, we barricaded ourselves in the beer fridge. We were probably in there for about 10 seconds before we lost power. So it just went completely dark. And from the glass door, you could see directly out the store. And you could see the parking lot and you could see the homes across. What you saw was stuff siding, leaving the homes, branches falling off a big tree that's outside. I could see my car getting dinged by uh, beer carts, shopping carts. I was definitely afraid for my life and I had no idea where my sister was. The adrenaline was off the charts. El Reno, Oklahoma. Jacqueline Whittle and her fellow storm chasers find themselves in the middle of the tornado's path. All right, there we go. Let's go. There's the wind. There's the wind. When we were trying to get away from that tornado, our whole approach changed. You know, the cameras went down on the floor. There was a serious tone in the car, and it was just like, drive. Boy, that's big. I lost space on my phone. It was accelerating, it was changing directions, and it was less than a half a mile away from our car. This is a very dangerous situation right now. This tornado was so wild. It went from a mile wide to over two and a half miles wide. It accelerated from 20 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour forward speed and did a sharp left turn. It did all three of those things in less than one minute. I I'm just not sure what's going on with this storm. I've never seen anything like this. One of the scariest images was we were trying to get out and go south and there were so many chase cars in front and behind us all we saw was brake light, brake light, brake light in front of us. I am worried about the amount of traffic. So now we can't get out of the path of this monster of a storm. Can we drive over there? A friend of mine had a transport truck hit him. I had another friend that flipped his truck and landed in a ditch. I wouldn't go much farther. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's all right, we're all good. We're all good. Jacqueline and her team outrun the tornado but others aren't as fortunate. Two of the best storm chasers in the chase community died on one of these side roads. It was the worst chase day. Any chaser would say this to this day. It's been the worst chase day ever. Let's turn the GoPros off. When all is said and done, the tornado is on the ground for 40 minutes on a 16.2 mile path. It takes the lives of eight people, including four storm chasers, all found in their cars. And for us in the weather community, it was a real wake up call, just letting us know that mother nature's always in charge. The tornado is accompanied by widespread flash flooding that kills 13 more. Everybody was really shaken up on that day. 19 tornadoes swept through central Oklahoma that day, El Reno and EF3 being the most violent. The vast majority of tornadoes happen one at a time. But what we are seeing is the potential for more tornado outbreaks, these clusters of tornadoes, where you have multiple storms all producing tornadoes at the same time on a given day. These are the types of events that tend to be very damaging, they're high impact events, and that's where you tend to get most of the fatalities. Dunrobin, Canada, a powerful tornado ravages this quiet town. Everyone in the sister's store has taken cover, terrified about what's next. I ended up in our office, under an office desk. You could see it was so dark and debris was actually flying by the front of the store. The noise was so powerful, and the ground was shaking. It almost, you almost thought maybe it was more like a earthquake or something, like, because the ground was shaking so bad. It felt like you were gonna get sucked right out through the ground. I ended up lying right in front of the meat counter with 
another lady and a few people beside me. The meat counter exploded, the glass everywhere. There's glass everywhere, all over my back. The thing I remember most about the storm is the noise. It was horrible. Glass breaking, the ground shaking. It's just so loud. If they say like a freight train is coming at you, I believe it. Beauregard, Alabama, the rogue twister that ripped its way through this rural town is unlike anything residents have seen before. As people sit and watch this, you cannot fully appreciate what has happened here. But the devastation will take your breath away. This was a, on a magnitude of, of, of scale that was beyond our capabilities and, and assets. Measuring nearly a mile wide, the tornado rolled through mobile homes, across fields, causing even brick homes to collapse. The sheriff immediately calls for additional help from surrounding counties. Meanwhile, Beauregard's volunteer fire and rescue services, along with hundreds of volunteers, begin the massive effort to find survivors. Our job was at that point to ensure that, that the emergency services, first responders, along with our personnel, had access to the area and could get in and, and begin searching and locating individuals that needed medical assistance. Meanwhile, Cora Jones is still searching for her parents and two brothers when she receives devastating news from first responders. There's one family in there that was by marriage, they're, they're connected, and there are over seven people this man lost in, in one family. So it's a, it's a tragic situation. That's the core of your whole family gone, but we ain't found your dad. And I said, oh my God, but I still couldn't cry. I had to find my dad. That's when we started walking, and I went where her mom was sitting, and I found her mom. As Cora sifts through debris, she uncovers her father, then her uncle. I almost stepped in his face, stepping over trees. And finally, her brother, Emmanuel. My brother, he was right there by the truck. I couldn't see his face. I just seen his body over like that because there was too many stuff in the way for me to get up to the truck where he was at. He was coming from over my house with the food. He was still in the truck. They throw him out the truck. The big, pretty rainbow came out of that and a bright light like an angel. When I went down there and pulled all that stuff off my daddy's face, there wasn't any blood nowhere. So I know when God took them, he snatched them just like that. Mama Faye was the same way. That's what eased my mind. They did not suffer, just lay there for a minute and suffer. They were gone just like that. That mean everything was gonna be all right. When it's all over, 23 people die in the tornado. Of those, 10 were members of Cora's family. Two days later, she learns her other brother, Benjamin, is alive, although in critical condition. Just a day we would never forget. The Dunrobin tornado took all of 40 minutes to cause massive destruction, but it wasn't alone. It was part of a superstorm spawning up to seven tornadoes over a two-hour period. It's extremely rare to get tornadoes this late in the season. One of the many outstanding features of this tornado outbreak was the fact that it hit so many urbanized areas. I think it just stands as a record for uh, Canada that uh, no tornado outbreak has affected so many people in different locations. When it was over, you just froze. You didn't know if you should look up and something would fall on you and then you'd be hurt worse. As soon as that 20, 30 seconds was done, it was quiet, quiet, quiet. I honestly did think we were going to die. I really did. It was so loud and you could, like I say, hear all the glass breaking, the roof lifting off the building, and then you didn't hear a thing. So until we started yelling, like I started yelling for Cindy and for my husband, Mike, the moment when we first saw each other, we just started to cry and 
We gave each other big hugs. <laughs> I looked across the street and I made from what had been 200 yards or away eye contact with a woman that is standing in what used to be her living room. All that was left was the main floor. You know, I mean, maybe she was watching her TV program or whatever. She was just standing there in complete shock. When I looked to my right, I could see more homes completely gone. They were completely decimated. I thought it was gonna be a, a mass casualty situation. Dozens of trees are downed, and over 50 buildings are destroyed or severely damaged in the Dunrobin area. In nearby Gatineau, that number is more than 200. And with almost $300 million in insurance costs, this 2018 tornado ranks as one of the most costly in Ontario's history. It really was extraordinary that there were no fatalities that day, considering the tornadoes hit so many urbanized areas. We've never had anything like this happen before, other than a, you know, thunder lightning storm and you might, the power might go out, but not anything like this, like a mass destruction. So it was very hard for everyone to, um, to understand and it was so overwhelming. We know that tornado warnings saved lives and I really believe that they did that day. Mutant tornadoes are now ripping through more populated areas and have many people asking, is climate change to blame? We've got to get far more effective at realizing that we cannot cheat the system when it comes to climate change. As the oceans warm and thunderstorm activity increases across the globe, tornadoes are striking more often in clusters and increasing in power. We could see more and more devastation as the risk of tornado outbreaks is rising far faster than decades ago with no signs of slowing down. And now these violent twisters are churning through densely populated areas not prepared for these catastrophic weather patterns, leaving thousands vulnerable and unable to protect themselves. It's really important for us to study tornadoes now to see what the trends are. The more that we can predict, the more that we can prepare. And if we're expecting more tornadoes to happen further east in more populated parts of North America, then we need to start taking that possibility very seriously. I had a very scary day in El Reno, Oklahoma, where I thought I would probably never chase again. But getting those alerts out is integral. It's a big thing to save people's lives. As scientists continue to unlock the mystery of tornadoes and their link to climate change, more communities continue to be on the front lines of this weather phenomenon. And those who survive their deadly impact struggle to recover and rebuild. Cindy and Julie Delahunt are still waiting for their store to be rebuilt and once again serve as the town's social center after the tornado tore it apart. It took away a part of my life that is very hard to replace. It's hard to go back there because there was so many good memories and they're all gone. Are you okay, Jill? Yep. Everything that Cindy and I had worked for, our business, it was like home to us too because we spent every single day there for the last 30 years, hours upon hours in a day, and just like that, everything was gone. <laughs> Let's get out of here. I'm out of here. Cora and her surviving brother, Benjamin, now live in a new mobile home on the land where her parents once lived and where a cross now sits, carved out of what was left of the tree where their father once sat. March the 3rd will always be with Borgora Scrum. I don't want to forget. And with help from the community, they also have an underground storm shelter to escape to for the next time. That one out there will hold eight people. So is anybody else in the community, you know, got a bigger family, you come get in there with me and Benjamin. Everybody looking out for each other. I am worried. I really am worried. Um, I think that 
these storms are so destructive, you know, as they already are, and if things were to get worse over the next 100 years, that could be really bad. This is the new frontier, if you will, sort of the fringe of exploration in terms of correlating climate change with extreme weather events. We don't learn from history. If we try to cheat the system, we're gonna lose, and increasingly so, we're losing around the world, and that's the way it is. As the eye wall began to hit us, the winds went from scary to terrifying. It crossed my mind that we had made a bad decision. They got a whole family out there in the water. I never in a million years imagined that I was going to lose everything again. Sandy is definitely coming into New York City. I did not see a living thing. It was apocalyptic. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. As the climate changes, heating up the earth, mega storms are striking coastal cities around the world with greater frequency and intensity. If temperatures are warmer across the globe, both on land and in the ocean, we could see more moisture-laden storms. They could be more devastating. Fundamentally, what people have to realize is that the weather of the past in a particular location is not a good predictor of the weather of the future. Since 1950, as the population and industry have grown, more greenhouse gases are being produced, which in turn are trapping heat and causing the Earth's temperature to rise. Warmer oceans and moisture-laden air are creating the conditions for mutant megastorms. From Nova Scotia to New York, East Africa to South China, nowhere is safe. We've materially changed the dynamics of the climate. By burning fossil fuels, we've actually changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, and it's being realized in the form of the manifestation of extreme weather events. It's the extremes that we have to keep an eye on because those are what impact society. August 2017. In Houston, Texas, a typical late summer storm is brewing, fueled by distant Hurricane Harvey. Friday night, it started raining a little bit. It was off and on here and there. Mother of three, Aisha Nelson, follows along on Twitter as her mayor tells Houston to stay calm and stay put. I went to the grocery store because the mayor said we didn't have to leave, just buy stuff and keep it in the house in case we have to be stuck inside for a couple of days. We're going to expect a little flooding. I told my boys, I said, if it's storm and we get in here and the lights will go out, we're going to barbecue everything in the deep freezer. So they was like laughing and thinking it was crazy. For Aisha, Harvey is nothing she can't handle. I'm used to the flooding because we always have a little flood in the apartments I live in. What was really interesting about Harvey is that it happened in a place, Houston, Texas, and surrounding areas where they get a lot of rainfall and flooding. They experience flooding all of the time. And so people were like, eh, we, we, we're used to flooding. This is not going to be a big deal. 12 hours after making landfall, Harvey is downgraded to a tropical storm. It appears the worst is over. It was clear, no rain, water, everything was dry. So that evening, we all were gonna go by my sister house. So about 9 o'clock, I'm on my way to my sister house. It started raining really, really hard. I could barely see it was flooding in areas and everything. Veteran hurricane researcher Hal Needham is tracking Harvey's path. His reaction is very different from Aisha's. The night before Hurricane Harvey hit, I was in town, I was looking at the forecast, and my heart was just pounding. It was after midnight and I could not sleep. And what concerned me was all the ingredients were there that it was becoming more likely something catastrophic could happen. I felt like it was going to blindside a lot of people. There were no mass evacuations. A lot of people let their guard down. And so my concern was a lot of people are gonna flood that have never flooded before. October, 2018. 
High on the Florida panhandle sits a sleepy town called Mexico Beach. While hurricanes come close, residents have managed to miss the devastation. My family moved here in 1953. We've been in business here since that day. Hey, Al. Hey, come on. where have you been? 66 years, I have dealt with coastal living, coastal weather patterns, hurricanes, been part of many of them. Mayor Al Cathy is on a first name basis with nasty weather. Hurricane Opal, Cape, Irma. We have years of looking and watching and paying attention to hurricanes. Everything always went somewhere else. Recent hurricane history seems to back up the mayor. The west coast of Florida is somewhat sheltered. Typically, in that stretch of the country, especially getting farther east in the panhandle, we haven't seen anything that strong ever. And this time, again, it looks like the pattern is holding and hurricane season is nearly over. In the northwestern Pacific, megastorms are called typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, cyclones. And in the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, hurricanes. What they all have in common is they feast on waters heated by the warming planet. The Atlantic hurricane season, which often affects us here in the United States, typically starts in June, but it peaks in September. And that's because although the air temperatures are warm in June, the ocean temperatures take a bit longer. 600 miles south of Mexico Beach, Tropical Storm Michael is creeping across the Gulf. Hurricanes require very warm ocean temperatures to form. The Gulf of Mexico was perfect. It was like a bath in terms of the water temperatures. Hurricanes really start by having a cluster of thunderstorms over warm water. And as the cluster grows, air gets sucked into the middle and we get this low pressure. And because the Earth's surface is curved, it starts spinning. Michael had the environment that just produced these towering thunderstorms that just developed and developed. Later that day, Florida's governor declares a state of emergency. Right now, Tropical Storm Michael has 50 mile an hour winds and is forecast to move slower and grow stronger, making landfall as a category two storm. There's a classification system called the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale that's really based upon damage and impacts of those winds. So those categories are one through five. The higher the number, the more catastrophic. Category two storms are serious, gusting between 96 and 110 miles per hour. Right now, about 100 miles out of the eye, there's strong winds at the surface. On Monday, it was category two floundering around somewhere in the Gulf. In the back of our mind, it'll do like all the other storms. It'll go west, it'll go east, it'll die down. What the mayor doesn't realize is that unusually warm waters and favorable winds are creating perfect conditions ripe to turn Tropical Storm Michael into a monster. In Houston, Texas, Aisha Nelson is on her way to her sister's apartment complex, seeking refuge from Hurricane Harvey's relentless rains. As we got to my sister's house, we went inside. I was soaking wet, but the news said it wasn't going to be that bad. So I went to bed, went to sleep, thinking it was going to be fine. Harvey was just about to unleash all of its fury on Houston, and that was in the form of rainfall. Harvey was very different. It made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane, meaning the, the winds were really intense. But for days, it just stalled along the Texas coast. Hurricanes move by winds caused by high and low pressure systems. Sometimes these winds slow down or push against each other, causing hurricanes to get stuck or stall until the winds change and push the storm forward again. With these stalling hurricanes, it'll park down the coast from you, and for days you'll get these bands of tremendous rainfall that come in, but there might be 12 or 15 hours between bands. So all of a sudden, the sun is out, everything looks okay, and then another band of rain comes in. So it's really hard to communicate to people that you're really in for a multi-day flood event where you could get 30, 40, 50 inches of rain. We've been seeing a lot of these in recent years. In Hurricane Harvey, it was these constant trains of moisture, these training thunderstorms that just kept dropping more and more rainfall. 
This is one of the calling cards of climate change because we know that when the atmosphere is warmer, there's more water vapor available and that really is the fuel supply for these storms. At her sister's apartment complex, Aisha Nelson awakes to find herself trapped. More than a foot of rain has fallen overnight. Sunday morning, we get up to try to go see if the water went down. The water started coming in in her apartment, and I was telling them, I'm like, look, it looked like it's going to be bad. In the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Michael is gaining strength and heading straight for the Florida panhandle. Michael is a dangerous major hurricane that is currently about 200 miles south-southwest of Apalachicola, Florida. And it's moving in a northerly direction about 12 miles per hour. It had the right look. It had the right ocean temperatures. There wasn't any wind that it was battling. It was the perfect scenario or the worst scenario. Maximum sustained winds have increased to about 125 miles per hour. Additional strengthening is possible. Mexico Beach has dodged the full force of mutant megastorms in the past, but they're not prepared for Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael is going to be a devastating storm to a part of Florida that's not seen a storm of this magnitude in quite some time. The time to evacuate and heed the local warnings is now. What made Hurricane Michael unique is that this did not start as an Atlantic long track hurricane. This started right close to home. It was born in the Gulf of Mexico it took no time for it to intensify very quickly, which really made for difficult evacuation plans because it, it ramped up very quickly. On Tuesday afternoon, there was about 225 names on the list that people who had stayed. Mayor Al Cathy has to make a choice, stay and hope Hurricane Michael misses or evacuate. We decided to go to bed, get up Wednesday morning, and make a decision. About 2 o'clock that morning, the storm took a, a more direct eye, an upgrade to a 4. And by the time Wednesday morning came, it was too late to leave. Scientists have a name for this sudden escalation of a hurricane's force. One of the things that worries me as a scientist about hurricanes is that we're seeing more rapid intensification. If you look at Hurricane Michael from 2018, a rapidly intensifying storm just before landfall. Rapid intensification is when a storm increases its maximum sustained winds by at least 35 miles per hour in a day. All of a sudden, you're jumping several categories of intensity in that last 24 hours before landfall. Since 1950, if we take a list of the seven hurricanes that intensified most rapidly before landfall, four of those seven happened since 2005. We're starting to see a lot more of these. Rapidly intensifying megastorms are leveling coastal cities and killing multiple people across the globe. including in March 2019, when Cyclone Ide devastates the coast of East Africa, leaving more than 1,300 dead, making it one of the most deadly tropical cyclones to hit the area. Two months later, Cyclone Fanny strikes, killing 89 in eastern India and Bangladesh and causing $8.1 billion in damage. And in August of 2019, Typhoon Lakima kills dozens in China and brings severe flooding, forcing over one million people to evacuate. Something that's particularly concerning about climate change and extreme weather, as people with the least amount of carbon footprint or emission profile are most vulnerable. We know uh, that these storms in general are projected to become stronger as climate warms. When people talk about, oh, we still have 10 years to avert the catastrophe, this is nonsense. And I think we're at a point where <clears throat> we all need to behave as adults and look at it clearly and honestly. We're morally obliged to do everything we can to try to do the right thing. Disadvantaged populations are going to continue to bear the brunt of floods, heat waves, and hurricanes. In Mexico Beach, Florida, Feeding off the Gulf's warm waters, Hurricane Michael is mutating into a Category 5 megastorm. 
I was actually in Mexico Meets the night before Michael hit. At the time, it was a Category 2, expecting maybe it could be a Cat 3 or Cat 4. Really, the idea of it being a Cat 5 was really an outlier. We didn't really expect that to happen. Category 5 hurricanes start at 157 miles an hour, and you know generally they're getting up into the 160s, 170s, and those are maximum sustained winds. Those aren't gusts. It's just catastrophic. It can take a, a piece of straw and drive it through a telephone pole. Mayor Al Cathy is regretting his decision not to evacuate. We huddled up there and said, look, you know, let's just prepare, get us some water, get some things. It crossed my mind that we had made a bad decision. October 2012, 1,200 miles away from Mexico Beach and its population of just over 1,000, Hurricane Sandy is churning northwards, heading straight for New York City, population 8 million. Possibly some thunderstorms near the center, which may make it a little dicey. And they're also reporting some turbulence in this quadrant. This is where the strongest winds were found. Is there any fool in New York flying right now? Besides us. Sandy was an unusual storm. Most hurricanes, when they are at that latitude, are moving northeast at a very, very rapid rate. Out to sea, gone, they might affect Nova Scotia. Sandy made a left-hand turn just as it reached New York City. Hurricanes don't do that. Just a little past 5 o'clock here in New York City, and it's already starting to drizzle a little bit. Storm chaser Mark Robinson rushes to New York to observe this historic event. Usually when I get to a, an area where a hurricane is about to strike, everybody's been evacuated, there's hardly anybody on the streets, and it's kind of eerie. And yet here in New York, only a few of them had cleared out. So it was like business as usual in New York City, even though this was going to be an extremely damaging hurricane. We're already seeing significant impacts from the storm, and the worst of it is about to hit. This is dangerous. If you don't need to be outside, don't take the risk. It's all about where the storm hits, not so much about how strong it actually is. There's just no other part of the United States other than, say, Los Angeles that has that many people and that much potential for infrastructure to get damaged. In Houston, Aisha Nelson and her children have been stranded in an apartment complex for 24 hours. The rain keeps coming and floodwaters are over two feet deep. And the water started reaching up to like the third step in the apartment. My friend daughter said the water is coming in through the back and it looked like her walls are starting to cave. I told her, I said, um, start unplugging everything in the house at the bottom so it won't catch on fire. And so I told him to fill a tub up with water so in case somebody has to use the bathroom, we can still flush the toilets and stuff. I told everybody that we need to go upstairs. Facing an unprecedented flooding disaster for Houston, Everyone in the apartment turns to Aisha. I have three boys, but I also had their friends with me too. I was responsible for other people's kids. So it was like seven kids I was responsible for. Not only did we have the Hispanic neighbors came from the other side, then we had another set of family coming where we were at. So and now it's like 30 of us. We all just sitting in the room. I had to go in survival mode to where I had 30 plus people looking at me. Twelve years earlier, Aisha lost everything but her life in the deadliest natural disaster to hit the United States in almost a century. Because I went through Hurricane Katrina, everybody just instantly thought that I just knew what to do. Hurricane Katrina is now designated a Category 5 hurricane. We cannot stress enough the danger of this hurricane poses to Gulf Coast communities. Katrina caused more than $100 billion in damage and over 1,800 deaths. My house was maybe 10 minutes away from the 17th Street Canal. That's the main levee canal that controls all the other levees. So once that levee broke, my house was underwater. The water had got as high as up to the roof. This is a family of what looks to be five people completely stranded. The family make it out okay? I don't know. I, I still haven't found my mommy and my two children. 
Katrina, I cried for a couple of weeks because I was like, I don't have nothing. I lost everything. I have no baby pictures of my sons. I have none of that, no memories or nothing. Everything is gone. I never in a million years imagined that I was gonna lose everything again. On the Florida Panhandle, mutant megastorm Michael slams into the coast as a Category 5 hurricane, with winds roaring at 161 miles per hour. The storm started around 11 o'clock. I knew within 30 minutes that it was a different storm than, than Mexico Beach had ever experienced. By 12 o'clock, you could not see the shrubbery right outside our window. We could hear, of course, things hitting the house. We couldn't see nothing. And uh, it was eerie to not know what was going on outside other than by sound. We huddled up and prayed and hugged everybody. Al Cathy is blindsided by a mutant megastorm phenomenon called a whiteout. Sometimes when you're talking about a winter storm, we talk about whiteouts. It can happen in a hurricane too, where the water droplets uh, and the rain are moving so fast that you literally can't see five to 10 feet in front of you. And it's just a wall of water. The entire world turns into white fog. Storm chaser Mark Robinson is on the ground as Michael makes landfall. The thing that I remember most about Hurricane Michael was the roar. It's the kind of thing that you don't hear as much as you feel it. As the winds began to really ramp up, we knew that the eye wall was approaching, the strongest part of the hurricane. And as the eye wall began to hit us, the winds went from scary to terrifying. We have big glass windows and doors, and you could see them flexing from the pressure. It was like an airplane. You, your ears, you could feel it in the house. I said, if that window breaks, it's going to suck everything out of this house. In Houston, residents are desperate. Floodwaters are over three feet deep and there are reports of multiple drownings. We just got rescued out, so this is the first time we've even seen how much, how much water it has been, so it's crazy. I have never experienced anything like this. I didn't even imagine that it was gonna be this catastrophic. Aisha Nelson, her family, and neighbors are trapped in a tiny apartment watching the floodwaters rise higher. That day, the rain was coming down so hard. When you step down into the water, it would have been up over your head almost. And I can't swim, so I was so terrified. People is drowning. The people underneath the bush over there. And they holding on. They got people on the roof over there, too. <laughs> oh, my god. By Tuesday night, Harvey has dropped more than 50 inches of water and there's no end in sight. We don't have no food. I haven't ate in two days. No water. My baby is dehydrated. All my baby doing is sleeping. All we kept hearing is alarms and the sirens going off of the emergency system. And it was just like, that was just another thing that was just terrifying. I'm praying that they get us, because if they don't get us soon, they're not going to get us at all. For because Harvey stalled, it brought in several days of several thunderstorms. And in each thunderstorm, they were filled with tropical moisture. These are moisture-laden thunderstorms. So just tons of rainfall out of each one of these. And you start training thunderstorms over the same city for two days that's already prone to flooding, you've got a big problem. 
Houston sits on top of wetlands and has poor natural drainage. After three days of Hurricane Harvey, the ground is utterly saturated. The forest, the fields, the wetlands that were originally here, they're now gone, they're paved over, and when the water comes down and hits these areas, it doesn't absorb. At the apartment, Aisha decides to move her family to higher ground. I decided to get on the roof because when I looked out the window across the street, the buildings were starting to come apart from the water. So I was getting afraid and I was like, what we, the next step, the highest place we can go is the roof. I just wanted to make sure we had a, at least a way out. But there's a problem. This window pane right up here was about the size of the window. The window was so small, I could barely fit through the window. And my son, friend, is a heavy set guy. He's like, he might be about 300 pounds. And I was worried about him. So if we had to get on the roof, I didn't want to leave this little boy behind. With 30 people relying on her and with no tools, Aisha must improvise quickly. I took a 20 pound dumbbell and broke the window. And once I got the frame out, I took two pillows and put it inside the um, windowsill so they won't cut themselves. I was not gonna leave that apartment without those kids. I don't think I would be able to live with myself. On the Florida Panhandle, mutant megastorm Michael is unleashing absolute destruction. Right now, you can barely see beyond a football field ahead of you. The trees are blowing sideways where I'm looking at from the, the foyer of this hotel. The wind just blew open the exterior doors. Yeah, it's bad. It was full bore. We're in the middle of an eye of the storm. We have sustained winds of over 150 miles an hour. The house hit my house, by the grace of God, held together. I have never seen the likes of anything like this, never. Michael was a scary storm. When you're talking winds over 250 kilometers an hour, that takes apart buildings. That means debris is flying through the air. If you're in a car and you get struck by a steel pole, that's going through the car. It's not even going to slow down when it enters your body. Michael is the first Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the United States in more than 25 years. Category 5, those winds matter. When you're talking about winds over 250 kilometers an hour and above, sustained, that will wipe everything out in its path. As destructive as hurricane winds can be, they are not the deadliest part of these megastorms. We often think about the hurricane wind because that's what the category number is based on, but really what kills most people is the flooding. So about 50% of people die from saltwater storm surge. Storm surge is where you have the momentum of the hurricane for days piling up the water on the one side of the storm, and it literally grows and grows and grows, and you can see the surge coming in, and that gets pushed on shore. You know, a lot of people lose their cars, lose their homes. Hurricane Michael pushed this 15 to 16 foot wall of water across Mexico Beach and areas just east of Panama City. I interviewed these two guys. They're talking on the phone and saying, where's the neighbor's house? Gone. They're just trying to survive the storm. The water's up to their neck and they're just being tossed in and out of rooms and, and being sucked in and out of rooms in their homes. Crazy, I mean, crazy, crazy story. One of the biggest threats of climate change is sea level rise. As we see glacier melt, as we see the ice sheets melting, that adds fresh water to the oceans and elevates the sea level. That's really water added on top of the storm surge levels. It's becoming more likely that something catastrophic is going to happen, it's becoming more likely that people are going to flood that never flooded before. On America's eastern seaboard, Hurricane Sandy is mere miles from making landfall in New York City. Mark Robinson tracks the incoming megastorm from Rockaway Beach. Even though Sandy was still offshore, I remember kneeling down on the boardwalk 
as this storm began to come in, and you could feel the whole boardwalk lifting up with every single wave. Mark knows New York is in trouble. Sandy is really beginning to make itself felt here on the north shore of Long Island. You can see the flooding behind me. In fact, I'm up to my knees in this water right now. Sandy is definitely coming into New York City and making a huge mess. The biggest culprit in Sandy was storm surge. The surge was going to be at its highest at the exact moment the tide was going to be at its highest, not only for the day, but for the month. And that meant that New York City was going to be dealing with surge like they'd never seen before. I remember walking down a street and looking at a sewer grate, like a manhole cover, and there was water shooting out of that. And I thought, that, that's not right. The water's supposed to go the other way. That definitely makes me nervous. That is water coming out of the sewer. The New York City subway, which is extensive, it goes everywhere in New York, that stood a real potential of getting completely flooded. And that's exactly what happened. A hurricane really produces a storm surge that has several destructive elements. The initial storm surge pushes in very rapidly, can cause a loss of life, it can cause, you know, a lot of damage to buildings, but then the salt water stays around for a while and it can soak into the ground. Buildings can start to corrode and fall apart. You know, a year or two after that storm, all of a sudden you're seeing construction fall apart. Why? Because it was inundated by salt water. This is Bond and Carroll Street and it was, and it's windy. When you put salt water into electrical <laughs> anything, uh, you're asking for serious problems. In Houston, with floodwaters cresting at 60 inches, Aisha Nelson has run out of places to seek refuge from Hurricane Harvey. We're on the roof now. We got on the roof about four in the morning. It's pouring down, raining. We have blankets on top of us. We all huddled up. It's like 30 of us getting soaking wet. We'll go in and out of the uh, window to try to stay a little dry so we won't be sick. And then the sun is starting to come up, but it's still raining hard. And it's like the rain don't want to stop. As the sun rises, Aisha sees Harvey swallowing up her adopted city. There was these three girls holding on to a tree and they were trying to hold one of the girls up, but the current was so strong, it ripped the clothes off of the girl, and they couldn't hold her no more. Once they let her go, her body was hooked on a fence. I found out that girl was actually a girl that I knew. I offered her to come over with us to the house, and she told us she was gonna go by a friend's house. That really kind of messed me up because I had just talked to her. Aisha is running out of time and hope. Me, my niece, my sister, we all were calling different places, trying to get us some help. Things was getting intense for me and my family and everybody around me. I see three dead bodies. No, please help us. <laughs> I just knew that we needed help. And Facebook was my only platform that I had at the time. I was just really trying to get out of home's way. It was terrifying that it was so much water and it was too much water to drink, so I was afraid. It's just unbelievable. We never experienced anything like this. Aisha's desperate pleas for help go viral rescuers are dispatched. But Aisha, her family, and 25 others have to brave Harvey's treacherous floodwaters to reach them. Once we came down off the roof, we had to go outside. The water was over the cars, but we had to walk through that water to get to the boat. I let my oldest son take my baby with him because I didn't know if I was going to see my kids again. 
I wanted all the kids to go and be safe. Because, you know, they, they're young and they had a life to live. I, I lived. If, if it was my time to go, I would have went. All outside. A day after Hurricane Sandy makes landfall, New Yorkers are sifting through the wreckage looking for survivors. I'm right by the boardwalk. People are walking around. It's about 10 a.m. And someone's apartment is full of sand. Sandy hit us very hard. It was a storm of historic intensity. Unfortunately, so far, we've had 18 uh, fatalities citywide as a result of the storm. The most unique part of Hurricane Sandy was the number of people that it affected. If it had gone a little further north with the same amount of wind and surge, it wouldn't have hit the most populated part of the United States. I remember standing in a park just underneath one of the major bridges that lead from Queens into Manhattan. And I'm staring at a city that is normally lit up with, there's activity, it doesn't matter what time of day, New York is always going. And this storm, Hurricane Sandy, had managed to silence it. Hurricane Sandy kills 147 people, including 48 in New York. It's the fourth costliest storm in U.S. history, causing an estimated $70 billion in damage. We are starting to see more and more billion dollar weather events. And I think many of the corporate entities in the United States are starting to recognize that. On the Florida Panhandle, residents awaken to the ruins left by Hurricane Michael's winds and storm surge. We are in Mexico Beach. This is a total mess. This morning, Florida's Gulf Coast, Panhandle, and Big Bend are waking up to unimaginable destruction. This hurricane was an absolute monster. So many families have lost everything. So many lives have been changed forever. Thursday morning, walking on Highway 98, the devastation was everywhere. There were just piles of debris. There were people going through those piles trying to find a picture or a shoe or, you know, some personal belonging. It destroyed our water tank. It destroyed our civic center. It took our fire department away. It took our police department buildings away. It took our meeting house. Mexico Beach, uh, just after Just the mayor, I went from being someone that, hey, my water bill's not right, or my garbage didn't get picked up, to how do we put our lives back together? We haven't had no way to connect with people other than walking around trying to find people, but this is, uh, this is unbelievable. This storm was, I mean, Catastrophic's not even the word for it. I've watched TV for years and seen people crying in the street and their houses are destroyed. And I've always thought, what a terrible loss. But until you live it, you can't. The feelings are different. And I can speak firsthand. I mean, that just took me to my knees. 80% of our city was destroyed during Hurricane Mike. How can Mother Nature in three hours do that? Crazy. I ended up hiking through a swamp for two hours. I had to traverse over new ravines that were cut from water. I did not see a living thing. I didn't see any flies, any mosquitoes, no birds, no fish, no snakes or frogs or reptiles, nothing. It was like the whole world was dead. And I think what happened is it pushed in such a violent storm surge. I didn't see the carcasses of any animals. I think it just sucked them all out to sea. We had four fatalities. But considering the level of devastation, I mean, to me, that's a miracle. I hate that we had any fatalities, but to see what our town looked like, uh, I think that's a miraculous number. It's the third largest recorded storm in the history of the United States that's ever hit a populated coastal area. Can you imagine 
what Mike would have done to a, a more densely populated area. In Houston, Aisha and her family are finally safe and finding refuge in the city's convention center. I cried like a baby because I was just so happy it was safe. Although dry and on solid ground, the trauma of Hurricane Harvey remains with Aisha and her family. They got to see everything, and they, they, I know they remember some stuff. And like with my oldest son, I feel like he deal with anger issues now. My middle son, he don't really say too much. He's really quiet. He keep a lot of stuff bottled inside. My baby, if he see rain and thunder, he's running and getting under the cover, or he's telling me, we got to move. A storm is coming. You know, he's terrified. When I sleep, all those pictures kept popping back up in my head about those people that drowned. <laughs> and I really think I have, like, depression a little bit, oh because with the last storm that was coming, I got into a panic. I'm starting to live life to the fullest and trying to do things that I've never done before because I know that life is not promised and things happen within the blinking of an eye. All evidence points to a reckoning with mutant weather. We know the climate is changing. It's warming. Sea surface temperatures are warming. We're seeing storms intensify more rapidly. We're seeing other storms stall out and dump tremendous rainfall. I don't know how well you can hear me because of the wind, but uh, it is about 6.30 in the morning on Man of War Key. In September 2019, a new mutant megastorm rapidly intensifies before making landfall. <laughs> Category 5 Hurricane Dorian stalls over the northern Bahamas. With 185 mile per hour winds, it obliterates everything in its path. Rising sea levels contribute to a massive 23 foot storm surge. To the world, Dorian is a harbinger of future deadly mutant weather. With all the studies that we've had and all of the worst case projections, we are in the crisis deep enough right now. It's not future tense. We probably will be looking at a, possibly a category six uh, uh, category now for hurricanes. Coastal cities could soon face a new type of megastorm, category six hurricanes with sustained wind of over 200 miles per hour and potential storm surges of 17 feet or higher. We've always had these vicious storms, and climate science suggests that these storms are having higher impact now. We're really loading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, heat trapping gases, and we're seeing you know, higher CO2 levels than we've ever seen before. We're trapping heat, we're seeing warmer climate, warmer oceans, and we're seeing a lot of ice sheets starting to melt. You add a hurricane on top of that, you're in a lot of trouble. A third of the world's population lives within striking distance of a catastrophic coastal megastorm. And with each hurricane season, more and more lives are impacted by living on the front lines of mutant weather. Here we are nine months after the storm, and you still see this. <laughs> There's just a great indication of how ferocious this thing was. You can't overcome 17 and a half feet of storm surge and 150 mile an hour sustained winds. We, we can't do it. After going through Katrina and then Harvey, if another storm comes and it says it's coming towards Texas of any sorts, I'm gonna take my family and we're gonna just leave because I can't take the chances of going through a third storm. I can't go through another one. If rapidly intensifying megastorms and stalling hurricanes are the new normal, can humankind survive the coming mutant weather? There's more Katrina's, more Hurricane Sandy's coming, and they're going to be of greater magnitude and intensity than the past. We know that the warmer the ocean water, the easier it is to sustain a hurricane and to develop a tropical system. So if we think of global ocean temperatures being warmer, that could mean that we see more of a favorable environment for hurricanes to develop. 
we can no longer get too anchored on the wind speed or the category of the storm. We have to look at the rain potential of the storm, how fast the storm is moving, or is it going to stall out? We cannot cheat the system when it comes to climate change. If we try to cheat the system, we're gonna lose, and increasingly so, we're losing around the world. People ask me often, do you have hope? And the hope I would have is that we will treat each other decent, and we will start to behave in a better relation with the Earth now while we still can. Because the crisis is upon us, and today is better than tomorrow. They come out of nowhere, boom, zero visibility. And that's terrifying. Weather systems have a huge impact on air pollution. You see these big clouds of pollen over top of the cities. It looks gruesome. Air pollution is invisible most of the time. What's out of sight is out of mind. I want to make sure my daughters don't have to deal with this invisible killer. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. Humankind is watching our planet warm at accelerating, alarming rates. A hotter Earth and shifting weather patterns are worsening air quality, fueling dust storms, and suffocating our major cities. Climate change is all about change in the atmosphere. It's weather systems shifting from one place to another, whether it's wetter or drier, hotter or cooler, that's gonna affect the level of air pollution in the air. Climate change will have potentially dramatic effects on different parts of the world for air quality. From the southwestern United States to India and China, the world could soon be facing an air apocalypse. When people think about climate change, they primarily think about change in temperature and warming. But the other thing that we tend not to think about so much, which is also extremely important, are the changes in air quality that we have produced over the last few decades. For over a century, our industrialized economies have been burning fossil fuels and belching pollution from smokestacks and tailpipes. This includes greenhouse gases that trap heat, warming global temperatures. It's been increasing a lot faster in the last few decades because we use a lot more fossil fuels than we used to. And those gases, of course, are retaining energy and allowing the, uh, the world to slowly but surely warm. As warming increases, so too does air pollution. Air pollution is too much the wrong stuff in the air at the wrong place in the wrong time. We have, along with the emission of carbon dioxide and the emissions of methane, introduced into the atmosphere uh, unprecedented uh, levels of lead, sulfur, cadmium, small particulates in the atmosphere, on and on and on. A lot of nasty things that dramatically impact our health. Close to 10 million people a year die from bad air quality. We have huge numbers of premature deaths coming from areas that are affected by severe air pollution. We're in the age of mutant air with deadly smog, suffocating pollution, and epic dust storms threatening our lives. July 9th, 2018. It's a dry and dusty summer in Mike Olbinski's hometown. Based out of Phoenix, Arizona, I chase storms for a living. Phoenix averages the second lowest amount of rain of any U.S. city, just eight inches per year, creating the right conditions for mutant storms called haboobs. The haboob is basically a dust storm, a wall of dust, um, and it has its origins from the Middle East. It's an Arabic word, much like the word monsoon, which we also use out here. In Arizona, some of North America's largest haboobs form, usually during monsoon season between June and September, when the state gets up to half its annual precipitation from frequent thunderstorms. And this July, monsoon season is expected to be true to form. 
July 9th, 2018 was one of my favorite haboob chases of all time. The elements are aligning for a mega haboob, potentially one of historic scale. To form a haboob in Arizona, we look for conditions where it's very hot, but it's also very dry. Now it has to be unstable enough to form a thunderstorm because it's that thunderstorm that creates the winds that picks up all that dust off the desert floor. There's thunderstorms that you'll get hit by a blowing wind and you also you'll know, like, whoa, it got really cold and this gust of wind hit and the trees start blowing and then maybe a storm comes behind it. But there was no dust with it because you live in a place that's just got trees and grass and all that. So out here, these dust storms form from thunderstorms, creating this big outflow boundary of wind that starts pushing up and as it starts picking up dust, you start to see that more and more. And so really the dust is just getting picked up by this wall of, of fast moving wind. Haboobs really are the gusty edge of big thunderstorms. And so they're fed by the size of the thunderstorm itself. The biggest haboobs are associated with large thunderstorms. Sometimes we call them supercell thunderstorms because they're big complexes of storms that are the entire depth of the atmosphere. And those huge storms drive out very cold winds at the bottom of them. There are different types of thunderstorms, a single cell thunderstorm, a multi-cell thunderstorm, and then the big gun, the supercellular thunderstorm, which is a whole other ball of wax. So that's where we're talking about something really different, and that's rotation in a thunderstorm. A supercell is one that actually starts to rotate, and that has to happen uh, due to wind shear. So when we have winds coming from different directions with height, we can get the entire thunderstorm to start to spin. And when a thunderstorm starts to spin, it can sustain itself for hours and produce a powerful downdraft that creates a haboob. When the rain-cooled air falls from a thunderstorm, it increases its speed. And like pouring a glass of water on a table, it spreads out in all different directions, picks everything up that's on that table. So that downburst is doing the same thing with the desert. It's rushing to the hit, hit the desert floor, and then it picks up all that dust, and it spreads it out in all different directions. A downburst is when you've got such cold air coming in from the upper levels of the atmosphere to the surface. And when that happens, we can get this cold pool sort of out ahead of the thunderstorm, and it often will form a shelf cloud, which are really remarkable to see, and they look like these, almost looks like the end of the world or a big spaceship coming your way. But what that is, is the cold air is pooling out of the thunderstorm, and that can create very strong winds and these strong winds are coming directly out of the thunderstorm and it can accelerate as it gets to the surface. So if you can grow a big thunderstorm and it happens to pass over a very dusty surface, such as a dry riverbed or uh, abandoned farmland, then it will kick up a lot of dust and it can transport those over neighboring areas, whether that's another farm or whether that's a large city. Anticipating a monster of a storm, Mike checks its progress. Waking up on July 9th, looking at the models again, they held consistent for three days straight. A very strong line of storms moving off northeast of Phoenix, where these cliffs and storms love to form on there, and the models just had a big, heavy line moving right through town. And I knew if they move through Phoenix and keep going southwest, they're going to pick up dust, because that's where it happens. Not only are they going to be good, they're probably going to cause damage. So there was, like, in a little bit of you know, nervous excitement for that day. But this storm is unlike anything that Mike had chased before. Ottawa, Canada. Don Jurgens and Daniel Coates track airborne pollen. And they're seeing some surprising things. Pollen bursts or pollen storms. Um, pollen vortex is also something I've heard. We see a much higher than normal pollen level in the air at certain times of the year. It's a large amount of pollen being released all at once. And you've seen things happen in, in Carolinas, in Australia, and in South Africa recently, where you see these big clouds of pollen over top of the, the skies or over top of cities. And uh, it looks uh, gruesome. Doppler radar can even pick up these pollen grains as they're moving across the landscape. 
changing weather can make pollen events much, much worse. If air masses aren't moving and you have the same air mass over you for day after day after day and the pollen season is underway, it can really produce heavy amounts of pollen. So we can start to see the pollen levels go from low to medium to high to very high. And that can really affect people that have allergy issues. Climate change is creating more days with stagnant air masses that keep pollen trapped at ground level. Pollen is a huge issue. It is something that affects millions of people worldwide. Pollen affects up to 25 to 30 percent of the population in any given country, and so it has a huge impact on both the economy and people's health. Here's what happens when pollen invades the human body. Pollen creates an overreaction in your immune system. Your immune system sees something coming into it that's foreign, and that's why you see people who get sick. You might get watery eyes or a runny nose, coughing, even asthma can kick in. And folks who have asthma problems really have to be careful. It is a severe issue for human health and human quality of life. And the fact that we just accept it as an everyday issue baffles my mind because people suffer dramatically. Some of them, it's almost debilitating how much they suffer from seasonal allergies. Mutant weather is forcing us to invent new terms to describe alarming phenomena. Terms like dry lightning, the polar vortex, and the fire nado. But the first of these new terms, smog, was popularized some 70 years ago in London, England. It was brutal, the smog in London was nasty. It was a result of burning a lot of coal without a lot of restrictions on uh, on, on the smokestacks. So it's just all that smoke was going into the lower lying air, which was combined with actual fog in the 1950s in London. And they had a lot of smoke and fog at the same time, and they contracted the two words together to say smog. The name smog sticks and quickly spreads around the world. Since then, though, we've really expanded it to consider modern smog, which, which would be photochemical smog, the kind of thing you get over a large city like Los Angeles, for example. Smog doesn't come in one shape or form. It comes in a variety of ways. That's what's so insidious about it. Low-level ozone, for instance, add into that particulate matter, mix all that together, shine sunlight on it, and now you have this horrific mix of chemicals that sits at a low level, sits right on top of your city. These days, photochemical smog, or just smog, is really a product of car exhaust and vehicle exhaust, and sometimes some smokestack exhaust, and other nasty air pollutants reacting in sunlight. Together, this big soup they form is called smog. And there are alarming signs that global warming and changing weather are making modern smog much worse. Smog can be really adversely impacted by weather patterns. The more calm or still that the air is, the more stagnant it is, the more likely it is for any kind of emission, smoke, tailpipe, whatever it is, to stay right where it is and not be blown away. And the more it can build up in a confined space, the worse and worse it gets, the higher the concentrations will be. Under normal conditions, the sun heats the earth, warming the air closest to the ground. As you move higher in the atmosphere, the air is cooler. The warmer low-lying air rises, and as it rises, cools again, so the air continues to circulate. But sometimes, low-lying air will cool faster than the air above it, which traps it under a warm layer. Cool air below, warm air above, this is an inversion. And as industry puts pollution into the air, it remains trapped close to the ground with nowhere to go until strong enough atmospheric activity can shake things up and move the pollution away. There's an interesting relationship between smog and storms when you have an inversion. Smog gets trapped in that lower atmosphere, right over top of the city that you're living in. And storms tend to break that up. They tend to actually overturn the atmosphere and clear out the smog. So your best days in terms of air pollution are just after the storms or during them. 
Some scientists predict global warming will worsen existing air pollution in many places around the world. Heat waves and increasing periods of stagnant air will cause smog to linger in place, triggering asthma and other dangerous respiratory illnesses. Phoenix, Arizona. Storm chaser Mike Olbinski is watching as a monster haboob forms. But Mike's got a problem. He's not even in the same state. The morning of the storm, I was out in California. I knew the dust storm wasn't gonna happen until later in the afternoon. I had planned to drive all the way back to Phoenix, get home, grab food in the cooler and all the camera gear, and then head south. And there's gonna be a big line of storms going through Phoenix and Casa Grande, and they're gonna push west down Interstate 8, and then we'll just jump in front of them and we'll have a dust storm. I raced here, and amazingly, we were just about 10 minutes behind our schedule. The haboob is not waiting for Mike to catch up. I saw some microbursts just kicking up dust. We're like, okay, here it goes. I got on the freeway trying to blast west, and there's a wall of dust in front of us already. So we were on the wrong side of it, and so I knew we just had to get through of it. Incredible. I go from crazy pouring rain to driving through just zero visibility of dust. Uh, Mike is a veteran storm chaser, and he respects the power of this haboob. Haboobs, once they hit you or they come out of nowhere, boom, zero visibility. And that's where it's terrifying. That's where bad accidents happen. Um, right around, you know, this area where we are, there's been um, multiple, like, multi-car crashes, fatalities. Oh, boy. Dust storms in Arizona are particularly deadly on the interstates. There's a stretch of interstate between Phoenix and Tucson that's one of the most deadly in the state only because of dust storms. Your visibility can drop from unlimited to only a few meters in a very short time, and that creates huge problems for people driving down that road. But haboobs bring another danger. These towering clouds of dust carry serious health risks. Some people absolutely love them for the photographic nature of them. Other people take them a lot more seriously, knowing how dangerous they can be. We urge most people to go indoors because a haboob is actually in this part of the country a health hazard. It carries spores and fungus that if you inhale, potentially can make you very sick. Haboobs here in the Southwest contain a mixture of very coarse sand, uh, which makes them look spectacular, but they also have much finer particles in them or they can have other chemicals in them. For example, if that dust originates over old farm fields that has fertilizer, then those chemicals be carried in the dust as well. Dust pollution is quite literally air quality problems that come from too much dust. Dust exposure can affect our health, mostly through our lungs. When you breathe in dust into your lungs, the natural thing is for that dust to be trapped on the mucus inside your lungs and you might cough or expel it in some way, or your body itself has uh, cellular mechanisms that will help get rid of it through your body. But sometimes it can be overwhelmed or it might not be able to do that. A warming world will cause deserts to expand and create far more dry, dusty landscapes that can taint the air we rely on. When we inhale dust, the effects can be immediate. We can be caught in a dust storm, maybe coughing and hacking right away, or they might be far more subtle effects that take years or even decades before we notice the health effects. There's an analogy called the boiling frog. And what this is, is the idea that if you put a frog in a pot and slowly turn up the temperature, it won't notice that it's being boiled alive. Air pollution is just like that. If you live with it for years and years and years, you won't notice that your lungs are being eaten alive. The biggest challenges health-wise from particle pollution tend to be lung problems, of course, because you're breathing them in, but they can turn into other things, heart disease, uh, breathing problems, even cancer. 
depending on who you are or how concentrated they are, can really be uh, pretty nasty. July 9th, 2018. Driving outside of Phoenix, Mike is white knuckling his way through the storm. After I punched that wall of dust, there's not very many stops on that interstate, um, but there's an overpass that I love and it's Beagle Valley Road. We're up about 30 feet, so you can see the mountains, you can see the desert floor. When I'm out chasing and I'm on something good, I literally cannot stop the car fast enough. I'm sometimes getting out of the car almost before I throw it in park, and I will throw my door open and race around to the back, and sometimes I have my cameras on the tripods already. Anything I can do to shorten the amount of time from stopping to setting up my camera, I do. And then I turn around and look at it. Oh my God. Oh. If you pull over. It just basically came right at me. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Mike is now face to face with a colossal haboob as its surrounding storm generates 45,000 lightning flashes. In person, a haboob can be kind of terrifying. A mile tall. Um, touching the base of the clouds with massive clouds building over them, 100 miles wide and um, dense and churning. And, and they can be freaky to kind of see coming at you, especially you know if you haven't experienced them before. The big wall of dust associated, you know, that haboob is really due to the thunderstorm winds collapsing and it pushes out across the entire desert floor, picks up all that dust, and it looks like a big wall of dust it might be moving at you 20, 25 meters per second. And so it's, it might look like it's not coming at you, but it's really progressing. Monster epic kaboob right here. This thing is unbelievable. It was started becoming spookier with big old thunderheads building over it. The wall of dust, sometimes they come and they're just a wall of dust with some clouds over it. But if you have a big towering thunderstorm above it, it's they're just, they look so scary. Ottawa, Canada. Don Jurgens and Daniel Coates have been analyzing a vexing increase in pollen pollution. No easy thing to do, given the nature of pollen. It's too small to be able to see with the naked eye, with the exception of um, the yellow ring that you get around puddles after it rains. It's not like air. You can see it, but pollen is pretty much invisible to the naked eye. So people inhale it, and they have no idea they're actually inhaling the pollen. To track increases in pollen, Dawn and Daniel developed a way to make the invisible visible. The samplers themselves are located at usually five to six feet in height, and so it's representative of the air that we breathe. It rotates at 4,500 RPM, and it spins for one minute and it's off for nine, and it does this for 24 hours. Everything that's in the air slams basically right against the rods that is coated in a silicone grease, and that captures all the pollen, spores, and anything else that's in the air. And once those rods are removed and then shipped to our office, we have a beautiful um, depiction of what's in the air through the pollen analysis that our, our technicians do. Once we receive the samples here at the laboratory, stain is added and then it's viewed under the microscope. And then one of our technicians will, uh, will view the sample and do the analysis for both uh, pollen and mold spores that is in the, in the sample. After the analysis is done, we take the counts and we, we create forecasts for things like the weather network or apps. And people can see up to four days ahead what's gonna be happening in the air. And when they crunch the numbers, what do Dawn and Daniel find? We have over 25 years of data for most of the sites across Canada. And what we're seeing is a large increase in pollen year over year in some of the major metropolitan cities across Canada. See, allergy is just getting worse and worse every year. It's a trend that worries weather watchers outside of Canada as well. And if we continue to increase the pollen, we may start to see folks who haven't been allergic to pollens in the past now become allergic because there's just so much of it in the atmosphere. Phoenix, Arizona. It's 5 p.m. and time is running out for Mike Olbinski to chase his storm of a lifetime. Haboobs are powerful, but also short-lived. 
Early on in the day, it felt like it. The models were very consistent, and as we were out chasing, um, the storms exploded just like they were predicted. But once they hit the ground, giant dust storms are also unpredictable. The monsoon is pretty tough to forecast. There's different spots of the state where there's, it's just going to be drier and there's less vegetation, and that dust is just going to feed into it and make it even um, better looking. And if a wall of dust starts traveling over an area where there's more vegetation or a city, it starts losing its intensity. So for me, I'm always thinking, where is this thing about to get good? Haboob was kind of moving to the southwest. We're going to go west, stop again, and then we'll see it. Got to Gila Bend, pulled over to a wide area that I know, and waited, and waited, and waited, and the dust never came over the mountains. I'm like, did this day just end? I was so excited about 20 minutes ago, and now I see nothing. And that dust storm had just careened off to our right to no man's land, and there was nothing else. And I thought the day was done for a second. And then I was looking at radar and noticed the storms coming through Phoenix were so strong and they were pushing down right towards us. That's going to come through and create the dust storm that we've been waiting for. Radar is the biggest tool that we use when we're storm chasing in the field. Basically, radar is sending out a signal to the storm, bouncing back to the radar and collecting data. And we use that to see you know, how heavy the rain is, we can detect snow, we can detect uh, hail. So went west a little bit more, pulled off in front of a farm, and sure enough, start seeing dust in the distance start coming again. And I'm like, here we go, it's gonna, we may not be, it may not be great, but at least we're gonna get some dust. And it comes through this farm and picks up, and it hits us, jump back in the car, go west again, probably like 10 miles, jump out and all of a sudden look back and all of a sudden this wall of dust has just changed into something even more incredible than the first stop. Dust is the food coloring of the air and you get to see the dust churning and swirling and what the wind is actually doing. And at one point I had you know a tight frame on it and I'm looking at it through my camera and it's just this wall just slowly marching across and there's mountains there and the mountains are just dwarfed by this massive wall and the clouds above it. It looked like it was just this ominous wall just slowly marching across the desert. When a muted taboob is on the move, most people cower and run for cover. But storm chasers like Mike see things differently. And then the chase is on again. And then jump in the car again right before it hit us, kept going again. We stop again and it's even better. It was so incredible. I just had to stop right there on the freeway and turn around because I did not want to miss what I was looking at. And I stop and I just look up and it's just a mile high and stretching across from me, you can see just the folds, the density of it. Some of them can look like, you know, an orange kind of like washed out wall of dust. This looked like a living organism and it's the density and the churning and stuff was was unbelievable and I'm running around just trying to take pictures of this and that and whatever I could to capture it. Climate change is influencing weather systems by triggering a chain of events that has surprising and dangerous consequences for air quality. Exactly how climate change is going to have an effect on air quality in the future is one of these questions that we're doing a tremendous amount of research on. I've talked to a lot of atmospheric scientists. One of the aspects that they've seen with their research is this clustering of events. Rather than having storm systems moving through, moving across the planet at a regular pace, at a regular uh, time, what we're seeing instead is these storm systems are stopping. This is new behavior for storm systems. What we're seeing is 30 storms a month, but rather than occurring one per day, they're occurring 10 in one day, and then nothing for a long period of time, and then 10 in another day. And you wouldn't think that that's associated with air pollution, and yet, when you only have these storm systems occurring in clusters, what you have is stagnant air masses 
sitting in one place for a long period of time. And that's a huge air pollution problem. Stagnant air masses just sit over an area. The air doesn't move. All that pollution that we're producing just doesn't get swept away. And we're breathing that stuff in and living in a soup of our own making. Think of it like a thousand cars all sitting there idling, dumping carbon dioxide, ozone, carbon monoxide but it can't get swept away, it can't get cleared away. Now you're wandering around breathing that junk in. So stagnant air masses are pollution's best friend, but humankind's worst enemy. It's nearly sunset, 200 miles southwest of Phoenix, Arizona. It's been a long day of storm chasing in 105 degree Fahrenheit heat for Mike Olbinski. We chased stop after stop all the way to Yuma until dark. The density and the structure of all of it, and it just kept going. And we got it at this place where it just lit up orange at sunset, and it was just churning down the freeway. And I've never had a chase of a dust storm that was just so thrilling, so photogenic, with the most perfect network of roads. A mutant haboob is thrilling to a storm chaser, but its surrounding storm snaps trees, drops hail, and creates life-threatening conditions across the Southwest. Flights are canceled and streets are flooded in Phoenix. This haboob must have traveled over 150 miles. There was just a lot of moisture, got the heat. We have something else, something juicier in the atmosphere to help enhance these storms, push this thing and make it better. Thunderstorms move as quick as the upper level winds want to push them. So they can go really slow. They can be moving at a snail's pace, like five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour. But then they could be racing across the central plains as much as, you know, 80 miles per hour, over 100 kilometers an hour. Upper level wind speeds and the storms they push across the globe are dictated by the rotation of the Earth and the differences in atmospheric pressure caused by the way heat is distributed across the planet. The largest haboobs that we see in Arizona, you can get the dust lifted up several kilometers off the ground, but then the winds at that level transport the dust horizontally, and you might go five or 600 kilometers downstream with that lofted dust. So dust that started in Phoenix may eventually end up in Las Vegas or Los Angeles. These storms were able to move along, hold together, and create this amazingly strong outflow with such intense wind, too. Mike is not going to let anything stop him from capturing stunning images of the storm's last minutes. When I stopped in Yuma to wait it out, it sandblasted my truck. The next day, I looked at my windshield, and I had tiny little, almost microscopic dings over the whole thing where basically it got sandblasted watching this just unfold and watching it happen exactly as you predicted and being in the right spot, having, you know, already predicted two days ago that I'd probably be here. These, you know, monumental days are the reason I chase. Baboobs, very awe-inspiring, very picturesque in some way. But then once you get in the actual blowing dust, it's not so spectacular anymore. Um, people will tell me later, like, I would have been running from that. That dust storm was coming to me, I would be, I would be hiding in my car, hiding in my house. Even if I didn't have a camera, I would stand there in awe and you know, let the dust storm hit me because um, I can't think of anything more exciting than watching these monstrous things of nature, you know, unfold before your eyes. Burning fossil fuels puts pollution in the air and heats up our atmosphere. That extra heat worsens pollution by shifting weather patterns which create the right conditions for poor air quality, choking citizens from Cameroon to India to China. Officials are closing down factories and schools, as well as restricting driving during periods of severe air pollution. Changing patterns of wind, air, and temperature are creating the conditions for a new type of mutant weather, the airpocalypse. The Chinese airpocalypse 
refers to the issue of significant air pollution. There's a couple of reasons that you're, you're dealing with such a horrific problem in, in China, and one is the manufacturing issue, but the other half of it is that they are dealing with dirty energy sources. They've got lots of coal. They're trying to catch up uh, to the Western nations, developed nations, by using whatever energy source they've got, and one of the easiest and cheapest ones is coal. At the same time, in their winter, with very calm, stable conditions, so that the pollution builds up near the ground in higher and higher concentrations, to the point where you literally can't see between buildings anymore. All the things that we enjoy, like smartphones, cars, forks and knives, all that manufacturing is now done in China. So we've taken all that pollution that we used to produce and moved it from our neighborhood to somebody else's. The main difference between the London smogs of the 1950s were that those smogs were made of smoke and fog, whereas the airpocalypse smogs in China are made without fog generally. It's really just stagnant conditions in winter with lots of buildup and a lot of pollution from huge, fast-growing cities. Climate change has warmed the Arctic Ocean and Siberia, reducing the difference between the warmest areas of China and the coldest, causing stagnant winter periods where air masses remain in place for days. In the Chinese example, uh, very similar, still a lot of coal burning and other fossil fuel burning. And uh, the sheer quantities there in the low-lying air in winter are making for really bad visibility as well as really bad uh, particulate matter concentrations. It's the concentrations of superfine particles that have researchers worried, especially what they call PM2.5 particles. PM2.5 particles uh, refer to particles in the atmosphere, really dust and very tiny uh, particles of soot that are uh, 2.5 microns or less, so very small, uh, almost invisible. They're microscopic, and they can lodge very deep inside your lungs uh, because they're so small. They get way down into the small alveoli, and if they stick there long enough and are not expelled by your body, then they can cause health problems. Tiny PM2.5 particles contribute to an estimated 4.2 million premature deaths globally every year. In China, the situation looks especially dire when combined with the effects of climate change. Scientists are finding that more frequent periods of stagnant air caused by a warming atmosphere will worsen China's smog and associated health problems. Add to that more frequent and long-lasting heat waves, and China is facing increasingly terrible health outcomes. This in a country that already loses an estimated one million citizens to pollution-related deaths each year. Ottawa, Canada. Pollen experts are watching levels increase year by year. They also know that global warming is increasing, and they wonder about the connection. There has been research fairly recently in the scientific community that has explored the idea that higher CO2 levels um, can produce um, more pollen in different plants. Looking at ragweed, they found that higher CO2 levels were causing a higher level of pollen being produced by single plants. CO2 is actually plant food. Plant food makes bigger plants. Bigger plants means more pollen. There's a lot of research out there that's actually showing the pollen levels are increasing over the past decade. That's increasing not only because of the CO2, but also because the growing season is longer. With climate change, what you generally see is uh, warmer weather. With warmer weather, you can see a lot longer growing season. This especially is true for the trees that we've seen over the last 25 years. So when you have the warmer weather, there's more ability to create more pollen in both the trees and the weeds and the grasses, and hence you have more pollen release in the air. An increase in pollen in the air could lead to an increase in pollen-related mutant weather events. As the pollen seasons get longer and there's more pollen in the air, you will see these pollen vortexes or pollen bursts happen on a more regular basis. You could see more and more of this happening in the future. Phoenix, Arizona. Mike Olbinski understands that the beauty of dust storms is deceptive. 
As climate change dries out Arizona and other parts of the world, these storms are at risk of becoming more frequent and more destructive. Climate change is changing things on a, on a global scale. The climate is warming, the glaciers are melting, and I kind of almost hope that a lot of the stuff we're scared about doesn't happen, but I feel like it's probably going to. And I do believe that because of climate change, maybe there's more drought out here in Arizona. And maybe 2018, the reason we had such an epic dust storm was because it was so dry that there was just dust everywhere. And then we had an insane storm pick it all up, and it was the most historic haboob we've ever seen. The fact that we are getting less rain and, and more you know, drought and heat, maybe we get less haboobs, but maybe they're stronger. We do see changes in the number of haboobs or large dust storms with climate change, but it's not always as simple as it seems. For example, because the uh, amount of dust that a storm will blow will depend on the supply of dust on the surface. If you have more rainy days, then you won't have as much. If you have drier conditions, but enough rain to wash rivers down uh, that then subsequently dry out, then you might have more dust. So it's a complex combination of conditions. Uh, generally speaking, areas that weren't arid that become arid are gonna have more dust storms. I'm an optimist about the future quality of the year because I think at some point in the next decades here, we're gonna get to the point where there really is a shift away from fossil fuels to renewables. And that will really help not only climate change, but it'll also help air quality because it, the source for both of them is burning of fossil fuels. Global warming is here to stay for the foreseeable future. The last five years are the five hottest years ever recorded. Climate change is happening, it will happen. We will see dramatic changes in the next few decades. Global warming makes air quality worse in a couple of ways. It makes us produce more air pollution because we're trying to uh, either heat our homes more or cool them down more. And it also can make the air quality that we have worse by making weather conditions worse for the air quality, make them more stagnant in some places or hotter to produce more smog. So actually two ways we lose with air pollution under climate change. The real danger with air pollution is that it's a slow moving, invisible killer. And it doesn't get you right away. It takes a long time to accumulate that damage, but eventually it's going to rear its ugly head. I'm definitely concerned when it comes to air pollution for my family. And our problems with air are global. Emissions and smog and smoke can travel great distances uh, across oceans. It can sometimes take days or weeks for it to do that. But if, uh, in fact, we can measure on the west coast of the United States, we can measure the odd air mass arriving that has all the signatures of Asian air in it. And of course, there's air from North America that makes it over to Europe. When pollution is blown away, it just goes downstream which would be fine if Earth was an infinite plane, because <laughs> it would just keep moving. But Earth is a globe, so when you move that pollution downstream, all that you're doing is moving it to somebody else or eventually back to yourself. Climate change will enlarge deserts in the southwestern US, northern Africa, the Middle East, and Australia, creating more places where haboobs could blast people with sand and dust. Asthma kills more than 350,000 people worldwide each year. A warmer world will create a longer growing season for pollen-producing plants, risking thousands more deaths each year. And as we continue to burn fossil fuels, pumping more harmful pollutants into the air that sustains us, Climate change leads to more stagnant summer days. The more than 4 million premature deaths we currently see each year from air pollution could continue to rise. Eventually, we will all have to reckon with global warming and its effect on air pollution. When we talk about climate change and air quality and health, it's easy to notice things that are easy to put in TV news, like hurricanes or major dust storms and aboobs. 
but in fact, the more dangerous thing might be the invisible part, the air pollution. We should care about the quality of our air simply because we live in it. <laughs> we exist in an ocean of air. It's what we need to survive. The billions of tons of chemicals we add to the atmosphere each year have mutated the air we rely on for our survival. And like the frog slowly being boiled alive, we continue to breathe the air we've polluted, ignoring the invisible threat to our lives. The entire sky went black really, really fast, and we just heard the loudest bang. All you could hear was screams and trees cracking. My husband looked at me and says, Jennifer, we're in some serious trouble here. These are wind speeds that are not to be fooled with. This is serious destructive power. I run to my son, and his eyes weren't rolled back in his head. Right window gone. Side window gone. The moment that I knew this wasn't going to be a regular storm was when I passed the municipal snow plow in July. Oh, man. With Mother Nature, you have no control. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. The sky above us is not infinite. In reality, the atmosphere is just a thin skin of gas held to the Earth by gravity. And that atmosphere has been fundamentally altered since the beginning of the Industrial Age. And now, we are pumping over 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. As the atmosphere heats, the sky often reacts with lightning, hail, and deadly storms. By burning fossil fuels, we've actually changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, and the weather that will occur in a particular location today will most probably not be that that was uh, typical of the past. But as carbon-fueled climate change accelerates the heating of our planet, these weather events begin to mutate, occurring more often, more unexpectedly, with greater intensity. When you've got an increase of carbon up in our atmosphere, that can contribute to intensify ongoing climate change impacts. So that means warmer conditions, that could mean drier conditions, and that could mean more of these storms. Climate change has supercharged the sky, unleashing incredible hazards from above. These monster storms, especially these supercell storms, are the most damaging, destructive, violent storms on planet Earth. We're talking about the amount of potential energy that is equivalent to multiple Hiroshima bombs setting off at the same time. That's the energy scale associated with thunderstorms in some of the most unstable conditions. Southern Ontario, June 2014. There you go. Chris and Simon Burden are spending a rare day yeah. off together. My brother and I are very close. We shared a lot of things growing up. Ever since we moved to Canada from England, um, we were really all we had for each other. The hard. Golfing was something we took up when we came to Canada. Chris is a critical care nurse. His brother, Simon, is a police officer. It was a normal morning, it was a beautiful morning, actually. It was great sunshine. We were excited to hit a nice round of 18. We got our cart, we hit the first hole. Sand it. Two hours into their round, gray clouds start to appear on the horizon. We hadn't checked uh, the weather that morning, and uh, by the time we got to the eighth, we could kind of see some rumblings in the distance. Uh, certainly weren't sure if they were coming our way, because obviously in a big open place like this, you, you never know where it's gonna go. A warmer atmosphere can create more convective energy 
the fuel for the convective storm that the brothers will soon be forced to confront. When we talk about convective storms, really that's thunderstorms. Convection is just the way air rises through the atmosphere to create thunderstorms. We are all familiar with the idea of convection. If you put on a pot of water to boil, it's gonna heat up and you're gonna have bubbles that eventually come up off the bottom of that pot. That's convection. The same thing happens in our atmosphere. The sun heats the ground, the ground heats the surrounding air, that air wants to rise, just like the bubbles in our pot. And at some point, that rising air is gonna form a cloud. And those clouds may, if they're strong enough, go on to produce storms, sometimes big storms. Unfortunately for Chris and Simon, the storm that's heading towards them is a very big storm indeed. We were on the fairway of the eighth, we heard the uh, club siren actually to warn golfers that adverse weather is coming. The wind was picking up, um, starting to spit a little bit, like a little bit of rain. The siren means to get off the golf course and get cover and get safe. In the face of lightning, it's, it's important to seek shelter because uh, lightning can be certainly deadly to humans. Lightning and humans do not mix right away we packed up our stuff and we started uh, heading back into the clubhouse and on the way we could see multiple people that were still golfing and i figured they were just trying to finish their quick round before the weather kind of hit we could hear in the distance uh, some rumblings of thunder and that's when everything kind of went south at that point Thunderstorms are extremely common. There are hundreds or even thousands of them that happen across the world every single day. These garden variety thunderstorms are just planet Earth's way of redistributing heat and changes in atmospheric pressure. But every now and then, when the conditions are just right, these regular thunderstorms can become monsters. With more heat available to fuel these storms, Scientists are warning us that we'll face more monster storms in the future. The northern nation of Canada is warmest along its southern border, where thunderstorms are most frequent. And the country's thunderstorm epicenter is southern Ontario, with up to 35 thunderstorm days each year. July 2017. Canada's Oastler Lake Provincial Park is a heavily wooded park just east of picturesque Georgian Bay. I've always loved camping. I've been camping since I was a little girl with my father and continue to camp with my husband. It's a chance to get away from the big city, to enjoy the nature and the peace of it all. On July 7th, 2017, Jennifer Foti, her husband and pet dog, set up camp at their favorite spot expecting typical summer weather. The day that we went, it was a beautiful day, perfect summer weather. The forecast for the two weeks that we were gonna be there was great. The campers are oblivious to the mounting threat in the sky above them. My husband and I were having dinner and we saw that our little Shih Tzu was panicking. I walked around the tent and I noticed in the distance a lightning storm was approaching. Mike Foley has been protecting Ontario's wildland parks for 30 years. We are here as uh, good land stewards for the, the property that we're charged with protecting. We're here to protect resources that uh, are found on the property, be it the, the land or the water. We provide a level of protection for the local tourists. We try to be ahead of any sort of severe weather changes uh, before they actually occur. The heat and humidity of July create the perfect conditions for thunderstorms in southern Ontario. But in most cases, these storms don't present much of a threat. We get a cloud. And then where that cloud goes from there, there's a million other different ingredients that we're looking for. Can it rotate? Will it have rain? Will it have hail? Will it have snow? Will it have strong winds, microbursts, straight line winds? There's so many different characteristics that come with each thunderstorm. This July, 
the sky is brewing a dangerous storm that none of the campers at the provincial park could have anticipated. In order for there to be storms, you need to have moisture, that hot, humid air. That's the fuel for the storm. You need to have winds in the upper atmosphere that are moving at different speeds or different directions to shake up that wind. And you need something to kick it off. Uh, a drastic change in temperature, like a warm front or a cold front coming into your neighborhood. That is enough sometimes to kick all that ingredients up into the atmosphere where they then produce these huge thunderstorms. As we were watching the lightning in the distance, we figured that it was going to rain. I've always enjoyed storms. It's one of my favorite days when the thunder comes rolling in. Having watched storms for years, Jennifer and her husband don't expect anything different from this storm. My husband and I thought it would be a great idea to put the chairs under our canopy and watch the lightning off of the lake. In Stouffville, Ontario, a big storm rolls across the sky. Brothers Chris and Simon Burden are forced to take refuge. We got back to the clubhouse and it really started to rain. The weather had gone from a really sunny, cloudy day to extreme rain really quickly. Thunderstorms are very different than, say, a big winter system or a tropical system. Thunderstorms happen in the short term, in, in the matter of minutes. They could be racing across the central plains as much as, you know, 80 miles per hour, over 100 kilometers an hour. So uh, those are very dangerous because they, they move so quickly. The entire sky went black really, really fast and it got really, really dark. We were lining up to get some food, and we just heard the loudest bang. It shook the building. It shook me. The sound was extraordinary. Like, it was one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard. And the only thing I could compare it to would be a cannon blast going off. You knew that lightning had hit really close. It was just pure white light. Never to that intensity have I ever experienced anything that was just so bright, so loud, and just you know, you felt it right inside your whole body, how intense it really was. Lightning is formed in a thunderstorm where positive and negative electron charges are separated by ice and water going up and down in the storm. And then that separation of charges creates a spark and that sparks a lightning strike. Most lightning actually occurs within the thunderstorm and stays within the thunderstorm. Only a small amount descend from the bottom of the storm and strike the ground. Some research suggests that lightning activity will increase as climate change continues. It heats up the air to a temperature of 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the sun, much hotter than the sun. So just to kind of give you an idea of the power and the heat that lightning generates. The brothers are reeling from the shock of being so close to a lightning strike. We saw a gentleman actually run into the clubhouse and he said, oh my God, somebody's just been hit by lightning. I looked at my brother and I said, oh my God, we've got to go. In Oster Lake Provincial Park, Ontario, a pleasant camping trip is about to turn into a terrifying ordeal as a vicious storm tracks towards the park. So when people go camping, they come here to disconnect from media. And they're not often behind the TV uh, watching the news or, or reading the newspapers. So if over the course of the day we're monitoring the weather and we see the warning, we'll go out and advise our campers. They might want to start getting prepared. But with a mutant storm bearing down on the park, there isn't much time for preparation. Storm rolled through at about quarter to 11 on that Friday evening. Mike is at home when he gets a phone call from a staff member at the park. My staff called to advise that a storm was coming through. They indicated there was a few trees down and that they were going in to, to do an assessment. It quickly becomes clear that this event is no ordinary thunderstorm. 
the alarm in their voice indicated that this was a little more severe than what we've been used to in the past. There are different types of thunderstorms, a single cell thunderstorm, a multi-cell thunderstorm, and then the big gun, the supercellular thunderstorm. Single cell thunderstorms are those little storms that pop up in the summertime, they rain themselves out and go away in about 30 minutes. Multi-cell storms have multiple cells. So a storm forms, there's cold air that is uh, put out from the rain and it moves outward and lifts the air to create more cells. So they can be very long lasting. The supercell, it has a rotating updraft, the vertical winds in the storm. We often call them the granddaddy of all of the types of storms that we see because they can be so severe and dangerous. If climate change causes more supercellular storms, the results could be catastrophic. Jennifer and her husband are suddenly blindsided by the storm. Within minutes, that light wind turned into the heaviest wind that I've ever experienced in my life. My husband looked at me with a worried look on his face and says, Jennifer, we're in some serious trouble here. This was the first time that I've ever seen a look in his face that he was so scared he didn't know what to do. Although thunderstorms occur virtually everywhere on the globe during the summer, in the warmest parts of the planet, they can happen year round. In Australia's warm, arid climate, thunderstorms are a regular occurrence. Climate change has brought stifling temperatures and a years long drought. When you've got drier fuels, you've got a greater chance for things to light up for a fire event. Then you pair that with an increase in your storm frequency, so that's your ignition source. We've got dry fuel and a lighter. You're gonna have more fire. In January 2016, a lightning strike in Western Australia ignites a wildfire that consumes more than 170,000 acres, killing two people. And in the fall of 2019, lightning is believed to have started a bushfire in New South Wales, killing hundreds of koalas in a breeding ground. As the fires approach Sydney, 3,000 firefighters have little hope of subduing the flames until the weather comes to their aid. The tropics of the globe receive the most convective storms of any place on Earth. They have the warmest air and they have the most humid air. So areas along the equator get a lot of daily thunderstorms. Florida gets a lot of thunderstorms. But those types of thunderstorms usually don't have what we call upper level support. So what that means is they're not anywhere near cold air. It's just warm, so they can produce lightning, sometimes a little bit of winds, but generally non-severe. On average, parts of Florida see a thunderstorm on 100 days each year. Bordered by water and with a subtropical climate, the area between Tampa and Orlando is known as Lightning Alley. The state has the most lightning activity and the most lightning-related fatalities in the United States. We have very warm, humid uh, bodies of water nearby, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, even the Caribbean Sea. So we have a lot of moisture in the air. And then we have the sea breezes, and they move inland from both the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. So you have the East Coast and West Coast of Florida being a peninsula. When those sea breezes come together, that forces the air to rise. That, that's your lift. September 2019, Central Florida. Bill Muller and his son head out for a day on the soccer field. Braden, we had to force feed him soccer at age five. But after that first year, he was on it, loved it. From early on, we knew he wanted to be a goalkeeper. On this day, Braden wants to watch his friend play in a local tournament. A little overcast to start the day. I think his game was around 10 o'clock in the morning. Some rain was coming down a little bit, never enough to where they, they didn't pause the game, didn't stop the game, nothing like that. When the tournament is over, Braden is eager to get in some practice with his dad. My son had mentioned to me, Dad, these are amazing fields. We've got to bring our stuff to practice for just for a little bit, because the fields are immaculate, man. You could eat off of them, you know? The skies were parting. Uh, yeah, I vividly remember this, the, the rays of the sun poking through. 
um, it, was, it, was, it was a nice day. Anderson Da Silva is a coach at the tournament. He is well aware of the dangers of lightning in Florida. I was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Over there, you, we have some lightning, but not as many as is here. You know, over here is nonstop. As a high school soccer coach, Anderson knows to be aware of where the lightning is tracking. I checked the uh, lightning uh, app, and it was over 200 miles away. And I thought, oh, OK, you know, it's really far. Like many other regions where lightning is common, most of Florida's public spaces have lightning detectors. Lightning detectors are great because, well, they let you know that there's lightning within a certain distance, but that's not going to predict where the next strike's going to occur. And then, unfortunately, we see too many cases of, of people being struck by lightning from the first lightning strike of a storm. Under a partly cloudy sky, Braden and his father enjoy a friendly game of soccer on the pristine field. He had just scored a goal on me off to my left side, so I was retrieving that ball out of the net when I heard this god-awful sound. As soon as I heard this sound, I knew it wasn't good. I didn't 100% knew what it was at first, but I knew it wasn't good. It was the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, just, it was insane. I stop what I'm doing, I turn, and I, I watch in him, he's falling over. At a Stouffville, Ontario golf course. A day of golf ends early when a ferocious thunderstorm descends on the area. While the Burden brothers are taking cover from the heavy rain, they hear that some of the golfers have been struck by lightning. The second we got outside, um, we started running. We ran to the uh, 18th green, and uh, there was four people lying on the ground. With lightning striking, with wind blowing, with the rain coming down, you're running into a situation where you can't decide if lightning's going to hit the tree next to you or if it's going to hit you. With Mother Nature, you have no control. We always advise people not to take shelter under trees or near metal objects because that lightning actually moves through the ground and you can act as the discharge point for that lightning strike. Just being outside, it doesn't matter what you're holding, you know, you're outside, you're already at risk, you know, if there's a thunderstorm nearby or overhead of being struck by lightning. As the brothers approach the four golfers, some of them begin to stir. A couple of them were kind of moving a little bit. We knew that they were obviously still alive. We approached the first body that was closest to us. We checked him, he was breathing and he was moving slightly. Someone called that there was another body that was still on the ground that wasn't breathing. His shirt was burned, it was torn, it had holes in his pants. His hat had burned off, it was to the side of him. The, the top part of the cap to the peak had melted away. His skin was melted away and he had blood around the nose and the mouth. I saw black marks and burn marks on his hand uh, that were, to me, were obvious signs that the lightning struck his uh, golf club and entered through his hand. And then I saw burn marks and holes through his pant leg, which seemed where the lightning had exited his body into the ground. Obviously, after I checked his pulse, we knew that he was dead. In Oastler Lake Provincial Park, Jennifer Foti and her husband are in a battle for their safety when a sudden storm intensifies at a startling rate. You could hear a wind tunnel. It was so strong, the wind, it was pushing us from side to side. We were getting thrown everywhere. We were being tossed, not back and forth, we were being tossed in a circle. Trees outside, you could hear them cracking. They were being pulled out. You can hear things being thrown around. Jennifer and her husband are caught in an unusually powerful phenomenon called a downburst. In a severe thunderstorm, when that warm air goes up into the clouds, it cools, condenses, forms rain droplets. That rain-cooled air 
now will want to drop. And sometimes it drops very violently and rapidly. And when that violently descending air hits the ground, it's got nowhere to go. So it spreads out. So you end up with this spread of damage from these downburst winds. The storm system that clobbers the park creates a swath of wreckage in the area. Its most violent effects come out of the blue, leaving campers with nowhere to go for safe cover. The storm came southward down Oster Park Drive, stayed pretty close to the road, and then it got a bit wider as it came into the park and moved into the park, swept through, and then went out this way uh, towards the west. A strong downburst can be as strong as an EF2 tornado. So these are wind speeds that are not to be fooled with. I mean, this is serious, serious destructive power. The Enhanced Fujita, or EF scale, is used to categorize tornadoes based on the damage they cause. At EF2, a tornado can uproot large trees with winds between 111 and 135 miles per hour. Convective storm systems can manifest in a variety of ways. This is a monster. Such as a derecho a fast-moving network of thunderstorms that form into a chain more than 240 miles long with gusts of wind over 58 miles per hour. On May 15, 2018, in West Virginia, a derecho forms and travels over 450 miles north along the East Coast, ultimately reaching as far as Connecticut. A derecho is sort of a leading edge of this long bowing wind system that emerges from this complex of thunderstorms. As they move along, they can destroy anything in its pathway. Some derechos can have wind speeds in excess of 50 meters per second, which can create a large amount of destruction. This storm is potentially the first derecho to reach New York City in many years. Along the East Coast, Tidal gauges record water levels rising sharply, leading to a meteor tsunami, or a tsunami caused by the weather. A tsunami is generated by a seismic event, whereas a meteor tsunami is generated by strong winds that create waves that are propelled inland and, and hit the shore. On his way to Ostler Lake Provincial Park, Superintendent Mike Foley is 45 minutes away. On my drive up, it was uh, quite ominous with uh, very high uh, lightning up in the clouds that was just non-stop bursts of lightning. So for me, that very eerie feeling as you drove up the highway, the moment for me that I knew this wasn't going to be a regular run-of-the-mill storm was when I passed the municipal snow plow in July, pushing trees off the road. It was a little alarming. There was a, a 400 plus people in the park, so uh, certainly my, my concern was for those campers as well as my staff members that were in the park. In the dead of night, the destructive power of the storm is even more terrifying. The fact that we couldn't see anything, that made it even worse. All you could hear was screams and trees cracking and you don't know where they're coming or something is going to hit you. The rain started to come down extremely hard. It was filling in our tent. You could hear a massive noise outside, trees cracking, people yelling. I was extremely scared. In the mayhem, objects are being thrown around by the wind. Something hit my shoulder. I was knocked down to the ground. At this point, we had about knee-deep water in our tent, and the tent collapsed. At that moment, I really thought that our lives were in jeopardy. And the storm is about to get even worse. Hail started coming down, and it was the size of golf balls. So we were getting hit by the hail. Hail is an interesting weather phenomenon. It forms in severe thunderstorms, oftentimes during the warm season. The warming climate can cause the sky to unleash many potentially deadly weather events, from high winds to tornadoes, flash flooding to giant hailstones. Guadalajara, Mexico, July 2019. Summertime temperatures have been in the 80s for days when residents wake up to find their city is buried in almost six feet of hail, covering cars completely. 
As that warm, moist air is going up into the storm, it carries raindrops with it, and it goes up into the colder parts of the atmosphere. If you climb a mountain, it gets much colder. Well, those rain droplets then freeze, and they get held up there by that updraft. That's what happens to these little ice particles that then get another layer of ice on top of it, and then another layer, and then another layer, and then another layer. And these now chunks or balls of ice have gotten quite big, and they're only able to be as big as the updraft can sustain. So the stronger the storm, the more vigorous the updraft. The more vigorous the updraft, the larger the hailstone that can be suspended by that air. At some point, gravity is going to win, and down comes the hail. In each year since 2008, there has been well over $10 billion in property damage from hailstorms in the U.S. Farms are especially vulnerable. Each year, as much as hundreds of millions of dollars of crops are destroyed in hailstorms. Front window gone. Side window gone. Back window gone. Hail can break windshields. Um, you know, hail can knock someone right out. Um, sometimes you can see hail collect on the roads and it actually looks like it could be plowed with a snow plow because there's so much little hail. In Stouffville, Ontario, a day of golf has turned into a nightmare. A lightning strike has left one man dead on the 18th green of a secluded golf course. He was lying on his back, and his hand was off to the side. Critical care nurse Chris Burden and his police officer brother Simon assessed the situation. The rain was still pouring. The clouds were still black. We could still hear thunder and lightning around us. We knew the environment was not safe. We could hear other people in the background yelling, we need to get out of here. You know, this lightning could hit again. Chris knows that if there's any chance of reviving this man, it's all up to him and his brother. It was a case of we need to do what we need to do to help this, this, this guy. We could not do rescue breathing because of the blood around the nose um, and the mouth. As the storm rages on around them, the brother's only option is to do chest compressions. I could immediately smell burn, and I remember doing a CPR and I could feel, you know, like a looseness. Everything I was experiencing was, was very visceral. It was very intense. Despite the immediate personal danger, Chris and Simon continue applying chest compressions in a desperate attempt to save this stranger's life. The, the gentleman actually moved. He actually moved his head a little bit to me. And I was trying to ascertain whether that was a reflex or if he physically had started to rouse. I told my brother to stop for a second so I could check his pulse and he had a very fast, very fast pulse. In Florida, Bill Muller is playing soccer with his son Braden on a beautiful day when there's a deafening bang and the 12-year-old collapses to the ground. I run to my son and I knew it wasn't good. His eyes were rolled back in his head. And one thing I'll, I'll never forget about that day was just the smell of um, burnt hair and burnt skin. Nasty smell. When I got to him, it was the only explanation in my head. You know, it had to be lightning. But Bill has never before seen a lightning strike on a sunny day. There's a common misconception that you have to be very close to the thunderstorm and the rain to get struck by lightning. But there's something really dangerous called clear sky or bolt from the blue lightning. The technical term is positive lightning. When you have a thunderstorm, oftentimes some of the high level clouds move out ahead of the actual thunderstorm and there's ice in those clouds. And so you get something called positive lightning as you get positive charge that comes down from the cloud. It meets up with negative charge that comes up from our head or from a tree and when they meet, they discharge as lightning. Those are the ones that tend to be the deadliest because they're the ones that catch people by surprise. As I scream, someone to call 911, this guy comes flying in. He flies in and jumps on my son's chest and doesn't hesitate, doesn't make eye contact with me. He just starts doing compressions. I said, you're hurting my son. Stop, you're hurting my son. He goes, sir, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. Don't stop, don't stop. 
Soccer coach Anderson De Silva has CPR and first aid training. He screamed again, got a little bit more serious this time. He got a little bit closer to me and, you know, you heard him, I said, and I said, I can't stop, I can't stop, and kept doing it. And then the third time, that's when I made eye contact and I said, I need help, help, and I can't stop. I knew he didn't have a heartbeat, that I knew. An ambulance arrives and the EMTs take over trying to save Braden's life. I back off and they start doing their thing and um, I see them loading him on the stretcher. It was that moment and I had to call my wife. I had to call my wife, you know? There are 45 flashes of lightning every second on the planet. A remarkable number of them occur in India during monsoon season. Rain falls for months over India, partially powered by the temperature difference between the ocean and the land. Since 1950, as climate change has disrupted this dynamic, extreme rainfall events have tripled. Each year, at least 2,000 people die as a result of lightning strikes in India, about 19 times more per capita than the United States. In July 2019, in the province of Uttar Pradesh, 33 people are killed in a vicious thunderstorm that causes the collapse of 20 houses. Days later, in Bihar province, thousands of people seek refuge from flooding on high ground. Huddled on a hilltop, they are safe from the rising water, but they've become clear targets for lightning. 39 people are killed when lightning strikes the elevated spot. The storm finally passes in Ostler Lake Provincial Park. As day breaks, one of the worst storms in living memory has left the park devastated. When the sun came up, it was very evident that the amount of damage on the ground was much more significant than we first anticipated. And uh, our eyes were quite opened at the amount of damage and the amount of trees that were down. It looked like very much a tornado had gone through. These severe thunderstorms carry extremely damaging events with them, flooding, hail, rain. Imagine Mother Nature going into her closet with all of her arsenal of weapons, and she is picking and choosing pretty much a little bit of everything. We looked around, and nothing was recognizable. The hail had stopped, but it literally looked like a snowstorm in July had happened. You could see your breath. It was extremely cold, and there was ice everywhere. At 7.30 in the morning, Mike Foley issues a mandatory evacuation order. There was significant damage uh, to the park as well as to the, uh, to the campers and their equipment. So it was, it was pretty devastating. Every single road in the park was blocked. You couldn't have uh, pushed a stroller through uh, for the most part. It was, uh, there was that many trees down. There were like full-blown campers that were like toppled over. Some woman, she was gonna go to her truck with her kids for safety. It's a good thing she didn't because a big tree was right through her car. The trees were pulled right out of the ground. Uh, and these are huge trees. Oyster Lake has some of the tallest trees. Uh, they were broken in every direction. The, the place was just, it was destroyed. As the Florida sun shines brightly in the sky, 12-year-old Braden Muller is in the hospital. His life is on the line after being hit by a rogue strike from dry lightning. My wife arrives and uh, that was very hard. Um, she walked around the corner and I saw in her face, you know. <clears throat> and as a dad, You're supposed to protect your kids, you know, so. You know, see, see, see in her face. <clears throat> I felt like I let her down, you know. At the hospital, Braden's parents meet with doctors. We sit down in a little hallway type of area. And he tells us, he starts telling us, um, talking about end-of-life care. 
um, organ failure, brain damage, a lot of things we didn't want to hear. Braden is fortunate. Like 90% of people struck by lightning, he survives. They didn't tell me at first what happened. I like remembered it. I had shot the ball and it had gone in like the right side of the goal. You're awesome. After 11 days in hospital, Braden is allowed to go home with his family. I think we're retaining information. I think that's been the biggest struggle. I just feel like my memory isn't as good. I'm, I'm glad that he doesn't remember a lot of it because it was, it was bad. You couldn't even lean over and talk to him in his ear because your breath on him hurt him. You know, he expressed numerous times wanting to die because he didn't want to deal with it anymore. In Stouffville, Ontario. Wow. Yep. Chris and Simon Burden are back on the golf course where they saved the life of a man struck by lightning during a mutant thunderstorm. The daughter of the man we saved reached out and wanted to connect with my brother and I, and they wanted to meet us to say thank you. Hello, Chris. You look amazing. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Great to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, man. You're Please. welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. You're my angels. <laughs> <laughs> It's intense that it just happened right there. People don't know the history of this spot and what happened here. I always receive a text message from his daughter saying thank you that I get one more Father's Day with him. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. For saving my dad's <laughs> life. And sorry, my dad. <laughs> thank you very much. The vast amounts of greenhouse gases that have been released into our atmosphere have transformed the sky into a threat looming over us. A warming climate means that there's more energy in the atmosphere, and more energy in the atmosphere can mean more storms, it can mean stronger storms, and as we move forward in the next years and decades, we're expecting to see a lot more of these extreme events. Warming temperatures could increase violent lightning storms in areas where they were once a rarity, making wildland fires more common while injuries from lightning strikes could skyrocket. More violent hailstorms in North America and Europe could routinely destroy property, cause serious injuries, or even death. And forests everywhere, essential for cleaning carbon out of the air, could be destroyed by powerful windstorms. The mutations in our atmosphere are here to stay, at least for now and we have just begun to see how the mutant sky will wield its power against us. The new breed of superstorms may transform our environment into a place that is incompatible with human life as we know it. I think my perspective has changed on storms. Whenever I see a storm that's close by, I am a lot more, I wouldn't say afraid, but I'm certainly a lot more intensely vigilant of, of the risks. Whenever I close my eyes, it's very easy for me to see that day. I can see the weather, I can see the storm. It's going to live with me for the rest of my life. It was very concerning to see the amount of damage and, and a little bit emotional that the, the park had been changed in such a significant manner. And ultimately it took 21 days before the park was able to reopen to the public. My husband and I refused to go camping again. It just doesn't seem safe to us anymore. If a storm comes, we're inside. And I see the storms getting worse. I mean, they're getting stronger, especially our lightning storms. Everything is getting, it's intensifying. The intensification of convective storms is an unforeseen consequence of burning fossil fuels. By lowering our carbon footprint a little bit, we will slow down 
the rate of change, but we're certainly not going to stop it. Got that much more CO2 or methane up into our atmosphere, that's going to intensify warming and just continue to really dramatically intensify all of those other cascading impacts that we know come from a warming climate condition. The greenhouse gases in our atmosphere will take centuries to dissipate. The sky holds new threats for us now, and it will not return to normal in our lifetimes. I am worried. I really am worried. Um, I think that these storms are so destructive, you know, as they already are, and if things were to get worse over the next 100 years, that could be really bad. Sure, our climate has varied in the past. Sure, it's actually even been somewhat warmer in the past. But those changes happen over the span of hundreds, thousands, even millions of years in some cases. We're now seeing rapid change over the span of years to decades. 